ready? Hello, and welcome to the Josh and Tyler Show with our day's guest, Nikki. Welcome. Hello. Hi. Good. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. I, I, that was my impromptu introduction. No silly gimmicks today. But that's how most sitcoms. <laughs> that's how most podcasts start off these days. Yeah, and sitcoms I was, too. Just someone walks in and goes, "Hey, hello. How see, you doing?" Exactly. I, I no intro gimmick, whatsoever. But it was we too hard. One. I was gonna sing Jingle Bells backwards, but I couldn't. I didn't have enough time. To, no, seriously. I, mean, I just didn't have time. You, that you woman, promised me there was no gag. But I couldn't Shame figure it out. You. I couldn't figure out how to do it, so there was no gag. So technically, he kept his promise in practice, just oh, not in theory. Oh, crying out loud. <laughs> So today we're going to be uh, talking about movies, we're going to play some games later, um, recommendations on Blu-ray for the last minute Christmas shopping and such movies we should see. But uh, really we just want to talk about the year in review for film. Um, how, how, does, how does the, how does the, you can, I got my computer up here. I'm getting my list. Tyler, why don't you start us off? This year for movies, like, how was that for you? Well, needless to say, it was technically a better year, all things considered, because productions were... They had rules on what you could or what you couldn't do, so we were able to, the economy in the market was able to do a lot more than it had before. Mm. There were some movies that came out this year that had already been finished, so that part was nice. And you can definitely, you can definitely sense that too, because in terms of how many movies I saw in theaters, obviously this year I saw more, but they were also like miles above in quality. One of the problems I had last year trying to put put up a best of the year list was that everything was either just the bottom stuff was just good, but there were only a handful of things that were great from start to finish, and they had the advantage of having made the movie before everyone else, mm. with some exceptions. Like I like Bad Boys for Life, not as much as you to put it up in an honorable mention, I really but didn't like that movie. it was the best of the franchise in terms of like having an actual story and fight scenes you could actually understand what the fuck were going it's pretty on. pretty much a lethal weapon sequel but with bad boys and that was okay with me exactly and there were some <laughs> things that i should have ranked higher like the empty man was really low on my list but it should have been a hell of a lot higher because mm. it's a 20th century fox horror movie that feels like it was made by david fincher for a24 mm. interesting there were entire scenes where there was no dialogue whatsoever that there were two jump scares throughout the entire film that I felt were actually warranted. Aside from that, there were no false alarms. There were no bursts of loud music. It relied on actors who you had never heard of before. I felt ashamed that I had no idea who James Badge Dale was. But having seen him in Empty Man and Standoff at Sparrow Creek in particular, dude's a really underrated actor. I mean, he I... looks like... He looks like an alcoholic Mr. Shoe from Glee, but... <laughs> A much better actor, if I'm being completely honest. And, um, Seriously, the yeah. curly hair, the dopey smile. The dopey smile. <laughs> sure, Matthew Morrison can sing, but um, James Batchdale can act, and that's <laughs> that's more valid for me. And I and I like Matthew Morrison. In my Spotify rewind, the song I apparently listened to the most, according to them, on the app was his version of "Friend Like Me" because oh. he put out last year a. Um, a Disney cover compilation, so he had Friend Like Me, Go the Distance, a few other stuff. He had this weird medley of Zippity Doodah and Bare Necessities, but yes, they sort of have actually, the same melody. They have the same melody and tempo, and it actually segues it actually segues into each other very nicely. I played that over and over again on the Go train when I was in Toronto for the festival, and mm, you got to go to TIFF this year. That was the other thing. That I got it. to be in person. Oh, nice. I didn't get to go. And the cool thing was, it was the most consistent festival I've ever been to. The worst movie I saw was The Eyes of Tammy Faye. What about that and airplane was, one? With, and it was um, okay. Just what, okay. No, what was that one with Chloe Grace Moretz you didn't like? Was that last year? No, no. That was 2020. Oh, okay. Yeah, Shadow in the Cloud was yeah. fucking trash. We, we probably have a review somewhere on there. I have one, yeah. <laughs> where I basically said it was 2020's um, Black Christmas remake, and I stand by it because it was garbage for the exact same reason. So how was the year in film for Nikki? For you, it was it better than 2020? Was it worse? Like, um, like how I... do you think about this? I think it was probably better than 2020 for me, because in 2020, I don't think I went to a theater at all. Mm. Oh. I just avoided it, um, just because of the pandemic, because at that point, I was waiting to get double vaccinated, 
I was waiting to see what stuff I actually wanted to see, like enough to go to a theater to see it instead of waiting for it to come to Netflix or be able to rent it at home where I felt mm -hmm. more comfortable. Um, I did watch some movies from 2020 in 2021. That counts. That's, yeah, that's that totally counts, yeah. fair. And, and so, because I watched them year. at home, right? And then there was a couple things that, like St. Maude from 2020, Saint that Maud. was crazy. That I was still have weird. to I still have What's to watch that, that. That's the one about this woman, and she's like a nurse caring for I think people who have like or like kind of palliative. I think she's, oh, at, I think she's a healthcare one. Right? I think she's at a hospice or something. Yeah, like that. Yeah, she's like kind of like a hospice. hospital. Well, she's doing at home care for a dying patient, right? So somebody who's got cancer, and she's having these weird like religious visions, and she thinks that she's trying to save this woman's soul, and there's some weird kind of tension between them. And then things get all kind of depressing and weird, and then the ending is like a jump scare, and it is like terrifying. It sounds like a horror version of Benedetta, doesn't it? When you think about it. I mean, probably, or like a more not, engaging version of The Nun, basically. I don't know if I would It does sound like not, a better version of The it's Nun. It's more of a psychological horror than like anything else. Okay. Right? Because you're dealing more with Maud and like her trauma mm -hmm. and how kind of messed up she is, and that her perception of the world is really off. And there's a lot of questions about, like, what's, until the very end, like, the last, like, jump scare, there's some things that happen where it's kind of questionable, like, is this actually happening, or is this just kind of in her head because she's uh, losing grip with, like, reality? That's a really hard movie to make nowadays, because usually whenever you walk into a movie like that, you already know what an instant, whether it's real or not. See, I think St. Maude did it well, though, mm. because they don't let on really until the end or that it's not. So the whole time they keep it really consistent until literally like the last frame of the movie oh. to like shock you into it. Because the okay. whole time you're seeing things from Maude's perspective. Oh, I've seen this Okay, trailer. well in that, in that case I really got to pick up on that. Yeah, it's on Netflix. It's, we it can is, watch it. It's incredible. Oh, it is? Yeah, yeah I didn't see it on really Netflix good. right here. See, there, all the stuff, most of the stuff I need to see at the, by the end of the year are like on Netflix. <laughs> like I need to see yeah. St. Maude, I need to see uh, Tick, Tick, Boom because apparently that was pretty well, good. I think it's interesting that you go right to horror because this year I didn't see a lot of horror movies. Like, um, I there was yeah, there was wasn't a lot there was movies. Lamb, which I guess was sort of horror. I didn't we really have... see it that way. Like, Lamb was still really good, which I didn't get a chance to see it. It felt more like a drama. They didn't overemphasize the creature feature aspects of it because, in a weird way, they played as straight faced as they can to kind of make you like be terrified but also laughing at it in particular that's why before the cameras rolled i said that it was it had that yorgos lanthimos style but it's not as dialed up and preachy and and it's nowhere near as goddamn weird that people that you that i can see casual audiences kind of getting into it at certain scenes. i don't know the reaction coming out of that movie was um <laughs> yeah that, that was the reaction well, i was like Thanks for coming, and that you know, because you know, I, I work at the Princess, you know that. No, 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 and that's so, fair. Like, that's and fair. everyone was like, they're like, I just watch. Like that was the whole reaction. Yeah. And that's... honestly, I don't know what other horror movies came out this year though. That's the thing. Well, you're I the one who told me. You're the one who told me about the Night House though. The Night House. Oh, oh yeah, yes, I that didn't was get good. to see that, but I wanted to. But in terms of, I don't know this year, but last year. Brandon Cronenberg's Possessor came out, oh, and yes. that was really good. Oh, that was something. That was a really good movie, because mm. I got to watch that, because, like, this year, part of why I didn't see a lot of movies until, like, the summer, fall, it's because I was working on my master's. So I was re-watching the same movies over and over, because I had to write a master's paper about them. Yeah. And okay. Possessor was one of those movies, so I was talking oh. a lot about, like, Cronenberg, body horror, possession horror, so I watched, like, The Exorcist, like, three or four times. I watched Possessor look through. Possessor was great though. Tyler has so many great. Yeah. You one thing, movie. one thing that was great about last year was that because there wasn't, there weren't that many movies to put in the theaters. I actually got to see more shit from Canada. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like there were five Canadian movies that I had seen. There was Possessor. Yeah. Um, uh, the Nest technically counts because the writer and director is Canadian, and I think they got some well, like production companies. Well, involved, what did you think of The Nest? The Nest was good. Was I, okay loved, for me. I loved love. Carrie. I loved Carrie Coon's performance. Okay, she carries a lot of it, like the back and forth love hate thing between her and Jude Law. Because Jude Law, you're not supposed to like in the movie. That part is as crystal clear as you could possibly get. I'm trying to think what else was. There was that that violin one too. You saw Song of Names was good. Yeah, that was that was a Canadian film with what's his name. Uh, um, Tim Roth and yeah. You know, but other than that, like Night House was really really interesting. 
Rebecca Hall did a fantastic Like, no spoilers, yeah, but, like, the concept, too. don't watch the trailer. That's what I'm saying. Um, if you're going to watch Nighthouse, don't watch the trailer because it spoils it. Um, yeah. Just yeah, go absolutely. into it blind. It's, it's got some really good sequences, great cast. I think it's just a really good little flick. Okay. It does have a great cast, but, like, it's one of those one-woman show type of movies where the side cast can get buried a little bit. Yeah. Like, um, Ben Urich from Daredevil is, mm-hmm. like, the one best friend who's always looking out for her, and you kind of forget that he shows up every now and then. <laughs> <laughs> you just like, forget that he's here, and then he's just like, oh, yeah, that guy! No, no, well, because no, we were... the Nighthouse... The great thing about the Nighthouse is that it has that empty man quality of being from a studio, but it's a little more artsy. No, I mean, oh, on the note of forgetting... We were looking at the Belfast poster, like, oh yeah, the older brother was in it. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, seriously, okay. that that was the one takeaway. Like, why is Who this is brother it? in there? He doesn't. Yeah, I don't even remember. Point? He talks to he talks to Buddy once throughout the entire thing. I, I don't know. I, I swear to God, like the Fifty Shades of Grey guy keeps disappearing in and out as for like. <laughs> oh, that Jamie Dornan. Oh, was yeah. Fifty Shades of Grey. Yeah, he was Christian Grey. Oh, okay. he was the Fifty Shades guy. This redeem Belfast. His performance in Belfast completely redeems that. Oh, yeah. good to hear. But like, he was a good actor beforehand. There was this one British. Uh, kind of psychological horror move show that he did with Gillian Anderson called The Ball. Oh, I've heard oh, of that. Where I've Anderson that. was this cop because she's one of those people who have like two natural accents. Because yeah. she was raised in Britain and raised in America. So it actually was legit. But Dornan was the serial killer. Mm-hmm. And you see his life as much as you see her life and in her investigation. So it has a nice cat and mouse thing going for okay. it. So, like, I already knew he was a good actor, and I wasn't surprised that he did a good job with the movie, but, I mean, we can't talk about Belfast without talking about Kieran Hines. Oh, he's he incredible. Was... Belfast is, it... is another one I haven't seen. I, I really I'm liked it. I think, I think at certain points, it brushes over certain po- story points way too quickly. Um, That's true. For certain characters, but I think overall, as a movie and a story structure, it's really great. What, 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 indie, what Canadian indie movies did you see this year? <laughs> That's a really good question. Because I, I have to look that up. Did, I did, did you see get to one? see French Dispatch? No. Oh, it's fantastic. I'm like super behind on a lot of movies. <laughs> what do you think of French Dispatch, Tyler? Because I really liked it. I thought it was great. French crazy. Dispatch for the first hour or so on both viewings, because I saw it twice. Oh, okay, wow. Week. Yeah. And I took my sister to see it the second time. I wasn't sure if she was going to like it, because she's pretty hit and miss with Wes Anderson. And I am too, but I've... I liked his later movies more than his earlier ones oh. because there's more control over the style. Mm. Like, the jokes are just as hit and miss as they were before, but, like, he's evolved as a filmmaker. Mm. And for the first hour or so, every single time, I could not stop smiling. I could There could have been a whole movie about Benicio Del Toro and Adrian Brody, and it would have <laughs> been amazing. And honestly, I just love the way that it... It's really hard to describe because these characters don't have a ton of backstory or depth no. to them. It's really about their overall personalities and what makes them all so likable. Mm-hmm. And they're all underdogs looking for this sense of meaning. And the sense of meaning for the journalists is to find people in the world who don't get the attention they deserve and highlight it in the newspaper. That part for me, I think, is what makes it thematically rich even though there isn't a ton of richness to the characters especially in the second short where you have francis mcdormand and francis mcdormand and timothy chalamet and i wrote this joke in my letterbox and i mean it 100 percent timothy chalamet is going to have to sleep with people three times his age for the rest of his fucking career <laughs> that's gonna be how we, that's his typecast <laughs> He's pretty much. Cast, I mean, he's um, a grave robber. All that's his type cast. Oh, oh. <laughs> retired. Wow. <from> <laughs> on, on the Timothy Chalamet train. Um, Dune. What did you guys think of that one? I haven't seen Dune. Oh, um, I saw. I'm, it. Like I said, I'm super behind. Okay, well then this will be a great thing for me. To no say. spoilers here. Nikki hasn't seen it. No, of course I won't. <laughs> I saw it three times in theaters. I almost saw it for the fourth time when I bumped into you guys at The Princess. But I didn't just because I didn't want to stay up that late. I have only one day off before like four days straight and then the Christmas holidays. I Mm. wanted to relax as much as I can. And this part definitely helps. But um, I fucking 
loved it. I could not stop smiling throughout the two and a half hours. Watch the good movies. This two and a half hours, and I <laughs> never really felt bored. And what amazed me about it was that Denis Villeneuve, a lot of people call him today's Spielberg. I would go further. Today's David Lynch. I don't know. I wouldn't call him that either. I would call him this movie in particular on the scale of David Lean just because oh, the okay. size of this movie is absolutely massive. It's insane yeah. how much of it was in camera. And even when it wasn't, the special effects were some of the most convincing that I've seen in a really long time. Yeah, really great. And um, it was weird learning how some of the techniques were accomplished. Like they didn't use quote-unquote green screens most of the time. They didn't even use those LED screens that uh, Disney does with The Mandalorian, even oh, though... Yeah. The rear projection? Even though that would have been good, I'm yeah. I'm sure they used a little bit of that for the one scene. A little the bit, but, scene, like, for... Especially for, like, that chase in the uh, sandstorm when they're on the plane, they mm. actually were surrounded by a screen that was the color of sand. See, that makes a which lot of sounds, sense, right? Which yeah. sounds weird, because sand is closer to our skin color that you would think the effects artist would have a harder time blending that stuff in without it getting blurry. Because you read about the Sam Raimi Spider-Man, where every time Spidey fights Green Goblin, they had to use, like, two... Spider-Man had to be standing behind Green, and Green Goblin had to stand mm. behind Blue. You wouldn't... Yeah. You would think that this stuff would be a lot more complicated. Yeah. I... But well, yeah, like, the size of it... actual details... Yeah, yeah, but the scope is so admirable. I loved it every time there was an action scene. Typical Denis Villeneuve fashion, there isn't a ton of action unless it mm. actually serves the story, but when it is, he films the fights on a tripod. Yes! He does not use shaky cam whatsoever. It is as clear as day that it is those actors doing their stunts. There is a little bit of quick cut editing once in a while, especially during the last fight. Because, like, the last fight is a little handheld, and they're on, like, a rocky mountain. It's just a fist fight. I kind of get that. But at the same time, like, I could watch Jason Momoa tear through these guys over and over again. Yeah. He was so fantastic. It's full of actors who you wouldn't even associate with a big-budget art house type of movie. You have Jason Momoa giving in his best performance. Dave Bautista wasn't in it as much as I hoped he would, because every his character in the books is apparently like this brooding, sadistic force. And in this he is a little too over the top, but at the same time, he does he gets the job done. Stellan Skarsgard as the villain is not in it that much, but it took seven hours to put makeup on as this yeah. as this incredibly it's really hard to describe. This um disturbing villain yeah. to look at who has this one ability that just makes you shiver every you just single sort of time have he to does see it. him in costume really honestly. that's why i that's why i closed my eyes during the trailers because everyone described how scary he looked and i'm just like okay i want to go in this as blindly as possible yeah. i knew that this was a part one that's the other reason i didn't watch the trailers was because i knew that i was expecting i would expect certain beats to be at the very end of the movie if i saw them and it turns out of course that wasn't how it played mm. out the performances yeah. were fantastic. Like, I wasn't a huge Timothy Chalamet guy before this because I always thought he had a bit of a blank stare. <laughs> and he still does in this, but at the same time, it actually kind of makes more sense. Like, second and third viewings, he became my favorite character because on first viewing, it was actually Rebecca Ferguson as his mother who has to kind of play both sides without being proud of it. Usually when a character plays both sides, they actually enjoy it or they feel it's necessary in her case she's absolutely she's really does it out of necessity because there's no other way of going about it yeah yeah well and the thing that i told josh that i saw somebody describe dude that the only thing i really know about the movie is someone said you know <laughs> in a move so unsurprising there's literally a prophecy about it a bunch of old horny men cannot peacefully coexist on a planet made of cocaine that was what the description of dune was and i went Okay, I should probably watch it. I'm guessing they're talking about the spice. The spice. Sort of, they're talking yeah, about the yeah. spice. Yeah, yeah. Which is sort of another worldly effect. And that's the yeah. other great thing about the movie. I've never read the books. I never saw the David Lynch version or the sci-fi miniseries. But I understand. I understood what was going on in this world. They actually yeah. is accessible, yeah. they explore the mythology without spoon feeding it to you like you're a fucking moron. 
but they also don't leave you completely in the wind. They explain yeah. what needs to be well, addressed. Because, well, like, Denis Villeneuve is good at that because he did that with Arrival. Like, that's a Arrival really hard... So he did that with Arrival. Arrival's a really hard premise to pull off if you don't do it really carefully because yeah. otherwise well, like, it's either too predictable or it comes out of nowhere. And then but I would take Arrival sense. over Dune. I know that's... I, I love Arrival. That does, Arrival's one of my favorite movies. That does so. make... I, I totally get that. Like, Arrival for me is the finale of Close Encounters if it was its own movie when you think about it. Because, like, they're already That's meeting right. up at the space station. They're learning of ways to communicate with them. And those sequences were fantastic. And you're right. Denis Villeneuve has already mastered visual storytelling for mm. a really long time. Because, like, every movie he puts out in the 2010s, it always ends up on my best of the year list. Like, Prisoners, Enemy, mm -hmm. Sicario, yep. Arrival. Yep. Blade Runner, Blade Runner 2049, 2049 is exceptional. It is absolutely. Yeah, Denis consistently puts out good work. Like, I never enjoyed the first Blade Runner, but 2049, I'm like, whoa. That was my like, experience. That's great. Exactly. This is, like, yeah. what is this? And this is, what happened to this whole thing? Well, I don't know. Denis Villeneuve <laughs> always kind of takes his own approach to things, right? So, like, any movie that he makes, you can kind of see his fingerprints on it a little bit. Like, you can see True. the things he's brought to it, especially for stuff like Dune or... Oh, yeah. Um, Arrival, which is adapted from other material, you can see the the Denis Villeneuve. That's true. Arrival was a short story. Mechanisms, yeah. yeah, and that's, that's the what... other thing. Like Villeneuve, the one weakness of Villeneuve is that he does he can't really create stuff from scratch. I've seen his first few movies, and they're not bad, except for his very very first one. I don't think August Forty Second on Mars was that good of a film. But uh, Maelstrom, I haven't seen on Sandy. That's the one movie of his. See, you go deeper than I knew that existed. <laughs> um, Holly Technique was a hard movie to watch, but that was kind of the oh, point. Yeah, I haven't that seen one. that, but I'm like, yeah, I can imagine that. that Honestly, would be cool. it's it's not as difficult as it sounds, but it nevertheless still is. Yeah, definitely, probably a challenge. And it's one of film. it's one of the rare movies about that topic that actually explores the before, during, and after, as opposed to just covering the event itself. Yeah. Mm. Which, uh, total hats off to him, and the main actress who actually was the producer, it was actually her idea to make mm. the movie. And since it had been 20 years, they are just like, well, if anyone's still mad about it, it's going to be the families, if nothing else. And sure enough, that was the case. And it's one of the few times people get outraged about a movie where you can't really say that they don't have a valid reason. Yeah, like you're dealing with real people's lives and trauma, they have a right to be upset. But yeah. I would argue that they still paid as much respect to the survivors and the victims. I like that the perpetrator, they don't actually name him or anything like that, which that's the only that's the only smart way you can go about yeah, it. Well, that's the way to do it. Yeah, you don't give them any And they glory. also emphasize that this guy had potential but pissed it away by doing something this stupid. Yeah, well, and that too, that his reasoning for what he did is just total bullshit. That, like, it's not because, it's not the fault of women that you didn't get into your college, man. Like... Not yeah, that and you would also think that the way his dad treated him, that he would have turned out the opposite. But that is one thing they don't ex they don't explain how that part works, and I felt like that would have helped. But at the same time, like how much how much time does that take? So let's jump into Nikki. Give me a couple movies this year. Give me two movies that you just loved this year that you couldn't get enough of. Two Whether it's old, it? new, just ones you watched this year for the first time, you're like, this is a movie I like. Um. I'm going to say The Last Duel because I want to give it credit because I thought it was incredible and not enough people saw it and I want to blast it out there because I think it has a lot of really good qualities and it didn't deserve to bomb as hard as it did. I have my theories on that. Um, and then I guess maybe the other... I'm trying to think because I don't want to say necessarily The Green Knight and be too like into the medieval stuff, but The Green Knight was also just incredible. The Green Knight's incredible. That right? was an incredible, oh, incredible my movie. God. That was the first movie this year that I went back to the theater for. Yeah, that one was really good. Mm. No, I have theories on that movie. Oh, yeah. don't we all? Uh, what, what, do, what, do you, like, what do you think The Green Knight means? Well, I think, I'm, I look at it too, because like, just for background, like my educational history is in, background's in history. So my degree is in history and like historical research. So when I look at The Green Knight, I look at it as a reinterpretation of a medieval text, but also as kind of an interesting, kind of like an interesting insight into how this particular director who's really attached to this poem feels about it and how he's using it 
to sort of sort out some of his own stuff because there's a lot of differences. There was a really good video essay on YouTube I watched where someone who's like an actual medieval, like kind of cla not classical studies, but someone in actual medieval yeah. history, because that's not my area of expertise, sort of went over how there's a lot of like really major differences between the actual poem and the movie and also just differences in interpretation and like what a word or a phrase or a gesture would have meant in the medieval era when people were originally reading the poem versus now when the meaning has changed. So I think The Green Knight is really interesting to look at as an adaptation of a medieval source mm. where it's not like The Last Duel, which is meant to be more of like a historical um, depiction. It's meant to be more like what actually happened based on the records, whereas The Green Knight's a more artistic, takes a lot more artistic liberties yeah. with the poem and like how it's trying to portray it and how it wants to go about it. The original poem has a lot more levity and comedy in it than the movie really? did. Yeah. Mm. The original poem is a little bit more lighthearted. And there's a little bit more almost jauntiness to it in a way that there isn't in the film. But I don't think that's a bad thing because I think that the film was really good. And I like that it's kind of a little open to interpretation, how it's not solid what exactly happens or what it all specifically means. And it's kind of like you can pull your own meaning from it in the same way that you can with a poem, right? Like it's Yeah. From what I understand, the meaning. poem had like a concrete ending to it as opposed to this one. And yeah, apparently we'll David more. David Lowry had a more a more concrete ending beforehand, but based on everything that you just said, he changed it like at the last second. Apparently yeah, well, the original the original cut that he did because he also edited the movie, he apparently wasn't happy with and then all this shit happened where it gave him more time to tinker around with it. Yeah. There is one theory that I've come up with that um, the themes about environmentalism are as obvious as you can get. There's literally an entire monologue from Alicia Vikander's character that kind of spells out what the color symbolism was. And that that part kind of got on my nerves because like you had all this great stuff and then you dumbed it down. Lowry did that with a ghost story where the those millennial hillbillies who live in the one house basically explain the themes of death that the ghost is experiencing. So that part, that part kind of got on my nerves, but yeah, my, there was that one scene where Patel gets kissed by Joel Edgerton. And I think most of us can agree when that happened, we just sat there and went, wait, what's going on here? That actually has to do with some of the uh, queer subtext of the original poem. Mm. Which I found out, and yeah. then it got me thinking about some other scenes that had played out beforehand, like the fact that in Garwin's introduction, he's sleeping all by himself in the brothel, and then it isn't until the Candor's character wakes him up that he starts to get in the mood. Yeah. And then I think about the scene, like, the fight between Garwin and the Green Knight at the beginning, where him beheading the knight but it comes back up might be an example of sexual repression where he's trying to say no to okay. any mm. possible same-sex uh, attraction but it's it comes back to him whether he wants to or not that's one see i thought it might I be have. about the plague okay uh, because really? the, the plague was prevalent around that time and maybe i'm overanalyzing this but he's he you, you can say that about anyone. Who but has a I think with I think he's already dead. I think he's already infected with the plague at the beginning, and it's basically telling about the disease at the time. I think that was the cultural thing. And so the only people who can pass it on are the people in his family because he's around his family, so he infects his family. So at the end, he's already accepted his death. That's why he accepts this Green Knight. The Green Knight, sort of this this figure of death in his life, and he goes through this whole journey. And then at the very end, that's that's his death from the plague. But the, re the, but the reason I say that is because the way the cinematography is done. It's beautiful. The cinematography is incredible. Is. But every I single never, shot... I had never heard of the cinematographer before, and I feel bad for So it. the cinematography, every time they show a shot of him alone, it gets a little wider and wider and wider and wider throughout the film as if we're going away from it, as his life is leaving him. So that's my theory on the film, but I loved it. I love The Green Knight. Um, just great flick <laughs> yeah like it was just gorgeous too like that What's was the other thing what do you guys think that end credit shot was because i i can't i can't put my finger on it oh uh, so that's that's his illegitimate daughter mm. and she picks up the crown so i think he may have infected her with the sickness if okay. we're going on your theory yeah but it I, also, could be, also be it crazy. could be like passing down a family disease or a family trait or like whatever it is something that's passed through the family well, it could that's also why be even them. It, like in a simple sense like trauma that could be it too, like yeah. just the trauma of of living through 
all of this shit, right? Like, just living in the medieval era is pretty traumatizing. But, like, like if the father has died, right? Like, his dog, his Ill- being an illegitimate child yeah. can be, you know. And it also, like, I could also take that. My other theory on it is it could be, like, this is his afterlife, you know? Maybe. Like, he's already dead at the beginning. The Green Knight killed him instead of vice versa. And this is how he feels like his afterlife is living out. I don't know. I, 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 I thought way too deep into it. <laughs> no, no, no. Well, well, like I said, so has everybody else who's seen it. <clears throat> well, and it's one of those movies that lends itself to thinking about it. Because, like, especially with the dialogue, like, it's not the it's not modern no. Like, no. dialects of English, right? So it's a very strange sort of world you're entering into where I think sometimes, too, if you don't have subtitles and you're not, like, reading what's being said, sometimes the individual words or phrases might kind of slip past you if you're not familiar with them because it's not the English we would typically speak, so you kind of have to get in a different headspace to, like, pay attention to what's being said, at least I did. Yeah. So I think that the visuals in that movie really helped because it's just so beautiful to look at and the visual storytelling is useful when you're dealing with people speaking kind of a dialect and manner of speaking that people just aren't familiar with because it's not common. Like, people don't talk like that. Yeah, and in the first ten minutes I got a little annoyed with it because it reminded me of The Lighthouse where I legitimately could not understand what the fuck they were talking about. See, but I love The Lighthouse. But Look, The Lighthouse like is Robert good. Robert is so d- dedicated to I like, haven't The seen Lighthouse is good and like when... <laughs> It wasn't until after I'd seen other reviews that, again, I saw the same-sex subtext that was in there before, where yeah. maybe Pattinson and Defoe had this love-hate relationship He walks time. around on a leash like a dog. That's some BDSM <laughs> shit. That, right you, can there. Def- you can definitely that's, look that's at it that way. Like I watched The Lighthouse, <laughs> and my thought was, what the heck did I just watch? Is it good? I think it's good. I loved it. Well, I knew I, I liked it. it. It's just, and plus the Greek mythology shit, if you paid attention in high school, you could yeah. already guess some of that stuff. Like the very ending shot where it's, um, is the character Burns. Atlas that uh, it's from? I don't I can't remember. Yeah, the guy it's... who gets his liver eaten by birds. Yeah, like that, that story I remember from grade nine because really no, I Atlas holds up that. the world. So I don't think it's Atlas. I can't remember who it is, though. It, me neither. Technology. Like, but I remember. I I noticed that. Yeah. Wait, does his organ regenerate? That's like he only for it to, only for it to be ripped out again. Okay. Like, yeah, I've like it's an eternal things... punishment. Oh, okay. Kind of like, like how wait. Sisyphus has to push a boulder up a hill forever. Okay. And... My Greek mythology is a little rusty. Yeah. yeah, and the whole hallucination of Defoe turning into Neptune, he could very well have been Neptune since he was the one who. Yeah. I guess, summoned up a curse of that storm, I guess. Well, I mean, I just really like The Lighthouse because, like, yeah, my background's in history, so I like how Robert Eggers takes these really deep historical research and, like, brings it to life, which for me is fun, especially when you combine it with, like, horror elements and some kind of psychological weirdness. And the black and white 4x3 actually added something to the movie. I thought it did, too. Like, it makes everything feel so much more claustrophobic. That's one of the reasons I'm looking forward to Joel Cohen's version of Macbeth with Denzel Washington and Francis McDormand. It had that look to it, and Macbeth is one of Shakespeare's most psychological plays out there. So I felt like that's definitely going to add a lot and create this almost horror type of atmosphere, even though usually when you make a Macbeth movie, you expect a lot of action, like that Michael Fassbender version that had a little bit of a Zack Snyder style to it. I'm trying to remember that version. It was Fassbender. Um, Marion Cotillard was Lady Macbeth. I didn't see it. The only Shakespeare movie I know is Romeo plus Juliet. (laughs) Besides, like the standard stage adaption. Okay, well, Lion King. It's Hamlet. It's Hamlet with lions. So very much. I love it. Can't stand that movie. And you're in the middle, aren't you? (laughs) Of course, I like Lion King. Why the fuck would I help? Lion King Two is Romeo and Juliet. Yeah. And the first one's Hamlet. Like, it's just Shakespeare with lions. Yeah, and, like, West Side Story is Romeo and Juliet. Yeah. Um, She's trying to think what else. Yep, that's... Um, ten Things I Hate About You. I think ten, ten Things I Hate About You is, like, Taming of the Shrew. Yes, that's Taming of the Shrew. I'm trying to think of what else. There's a few others. There's these. so many. There's at, so at many. At least watch the like Kenneth this. Branagh Hamlet. That is a damn good Shakespeare I've movie. seen a bunch of, a bunch of these things. They just don't do much for me. No, that's fair. I just, like, think, most I just these... think, you know, when they introduce Shakespeare to you, they you ever, make you read it. It's meant seen... to be acted out and on stage, so you lose something oh, no, in I translation. Agree. That was actually something that in high school, one of my teachers, like, he was like, we're going to watch this like, video of a play of 12 He's like, I can't actually take you to see it, but, like, 
You're yeah. not going to understand it if you can't see it. Because if you're warm? Like, yeah. Because all the comedy gets lost. Like, all of the, the nuances of the character directions get lost. Yep. That's why I think, like, Shakespeare adaptations for film work great because they're meant to be yeah. seen the like that. Right? It's meant to be watched. Yeah. So that's I think the, it does That's well. kind of what I'm looking forward to Cohen's because he, yeah. um, he made this really interesting choice of shooting the entire movie on, like, film stages. Oh, okay. So it'll apparently have this theatrical aspect to it along with the cinematic side of things. Well, almost kind of old Hollywood, right? The soundstage A hundred percent. Feeling, right? Yeah. That kind of vibe. And it depends how good it is. Francis McDormand, Denzel Washington could get some noms at the Oscars. Maybe. They will to- They will totally get Hopefully. consideration. Maybe like, McDorm- McDormand right. definitely will as Lady Macbeth, if I have to be completely honest. Because, I mean, she's already got three Oscars herself. She's kind of turning into a Meryl Streep with how many nominations she's Well, see, had. that's what I wanted to put on my list this year. I-, I don't know if I'll ever watch it again, but Nomadland left a big impression on me. I haven't seen that Same. one yet. That was one of the movies, <laughs> it was, that was one of the movies I saw it. at 2020, Tiff. And by that I mean, like, from my uh, office desk in my room. <laughs> TV. Yeah. But um, that movie just did so much for me. And you're right, I don't see it having, I don't see Nomad Land having a ton of rewatchability to it. No, but like the way that they painted the landscape and the atmosphere and the subtle use of music and just, it was just, a slice of life that you like just drew you in you watched and you're like a little uncomfortable but i'm learning something (laughs) for sure and it's the only good chloe Zhao movie i've seen i've seen a bad movie of hers this year yeah that's gonna be on that list we'll definitely get to that (laughs) at some point another one i'll throw out there is i loved free guy I loved Free Guy. See, I didn't watch it, and Me I think neither. part of the reason I didn't watch it is because when I saw the trailer, I thought this looks pretty goofy. It is. And I don't know if I want to spend money and go to the theater and watch it. Like I'll probably watch it if it's got. It's it's positive. honestly really fun. It's on it Disney is. Plus. You can watch it. Yeah, I'll probably watch it. But Ryan time. Reynolds is just an, a a video game character who who comes to life. See, and Hannibal Burris is his sidekick, it's best Hannibal friend, is a Burris. mailman. I'm not a Hannibal Burris. Guy. Oh, he's I'm so like good. Burris. I'm the opposite. I like Hannibal Burris. I don't really care for Ryan Reynolds. I don't hate him, but I'm like, I don't get the hype. If that's that makes of, sense. My wife loves Ryan Reynolds. That's this, kind of the reason I didn't see Free Guy was just because I know Ryan Reynolds is talented and I know he's funny, but the reason I didn't watch Free Guy or Red Notice, same thing with The Rock, Red Notice is, is that, crap. Is that I'm just sick and tired of seeing actors play themselves and call it playing a character at this point. Yeah, I mean, the only person, like, you mentioned, like, The Rock. I feel like Dwayne Johnson, to me, can get away with that forever. I will watch The Rock play The Rock in every movie but for here's the rest the thing. of my life. Because I know that I'm signing up for that when you watch The Rock in a movie. But here's movie. the thing. When you see The Rock in a movie, you know that it's going to be a PG-13 action movie. Yeah. I, That's um, fair. I listened to a podcast with the Flick Pick and Chris Stuckman where, they, where they're just sitting there going, has Dwayne Johnson done anything R-rated? And it turns out he has done a few, like uh, Faster was R-rated. Oh, okay. But yeah. they just sat there and, and they were like, well, he doesn't pick good R-rated movies mm. to do. Well, and I think, too, a lot of that's just because of his brand with being part of the WWE. What's your target demographic? You don't want to alienate the teenagers. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, into I wrestling, I guess. But are there still teenagers who are into wrestling? Yeah, I still, yeah, I, no, I, still it's feel, huge. I still feel like that's a predominantly adult demographic. Well, see, when you get wrestling, you get you don't find a lot of fans, but the fans that are there buy all the merch, go yeah. all the shows, well, they're have fans. the t-shirts, and they are super fans. My dad and my uncles used to like hang out in their basement every Monday when during the Austin era, like mm. right before The Rock and all that, all that kind of jazz. Well, I mean, Free Guy. Seriously, it's 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 got a lot of heart. That's what I like okay. about it. So it oh, looks like a, question. no, because it's basically they these two game designers design this video game world. A bigger company run by Taika Waititi scoops it up. Oh, Taika Waititi! Ta- he's the bad guy. Oh my god, I have to see Taika Waititi. And, and the so bad guy. what it is is the main designer has always been in love with his partner here, and he can never say ask her out. So he creates his whole video game character, Ryan Reynolds, to everything she likes. So he can talk to her in the game, and he makes okay. it everything like it, and it's really adorable. And the end is like, well, you know, Ryan Reynolds' character, and they interact, and like, it's real life, and it's just a really adorable love story. 
See, part of that is like... That's what it is. I think part of it, too, is it reminded me too much of, like, Ready Player One, which I no. think is the stupidest okay. thing on the planet. Ready, Ready, Ready Player One. One. I hate Ready Player Had One. Had potential. It but did. Spielberg it did. can't direct anymore. Well, also... That's no, not true. I think the book... That's not true. ...sucks. <laughs> Ready Player One is a book not well written. It's a bad book. And the concept... I don't like the concept. I, look, so I, I don't, don't think, think there was any saving Ready Player One. I think One. Ready Player One has a good concept, but, like, Ernest Klein is not the person to do it. Yeah, like, Ernest Klein can't fucking write. Like, I just think... Like, you can read excerpts. I've read some excerpts from Ready Player One that are particularly goofy. I've seen Amanda Jedi, like, uh, run down the synopsis of Ready Player Two, and I just sat there and I'm like, what the fuck were they thinking? And, like, I think that the problem then with the movie, Ready Player One, is it ends up being, like, just kind of, uh, like, literally, like, I'm not even huge into South Park, but, like, the members, remember? Remember the Iron Giant? Remember all these things you used to love? It's just it's that. nostalgia. That's what it's, it is. It's just nostalgia. But then my biggest idiot. problem with that is it. if it was just a quick thing, they get to the end of the game, they beat the game, everything is good, and they cut. But they have to wrap it up. Someone's got to have the company and someone's got to have this. Spielberg yeah. has to wrap up every damn fucking plot line. Everything's got to have a tiny little bow on it around a yellow ribbon. And I'm so, just like, y'all need to stop. I'm just going to talk about a different best movie on my list. But once you said that Steven Spielberg can't direct anymore... Munich isn't good. The last... <laughs> The most recent movie I've seen in theaters before Nightmare Alley, for the second time, was his version of West Side Story. This is the best movie he has made since Catch, since Saving Private Ryan. I'm Not dead serious first. about okay. this. Because I haven't seen the new West Side Story. I wasn't even bother- going to bother to watch fun it. Fun thing, like, though. Spielberg, this is his first musical ever. But you, Interesting. But you wouldn't have guessed. Because... Dude knew exactly how to make an old school musical, and more importantly, because he's Spielberg, he was actually allowed to do it in the first place. Well, and to do it with the budget that mm. it requires. To exactly, make it look like good. seeing all of these people nail their choreography in as long of a take as you could possible on actual streets, actual sets. They're singing and talking as they're strolling down the street, and a car will come this close to nailing them in one take. Like, there's so much precision with the cinematography the choreography which is the main reason to check out West Side Mm. Story whether it be on stage or on screen the choreographer did a good job of mixing the original stuff while making it a little more grounded like there's no parkour flips or backflips and admittedly I would have liked to have seen that that's Probably the one thing the original movie has above this is that it has slightly (laughs) it's got parkour slightly more acrobatic choreography yeah, yeah. and i like to see that more in musicals because if you're gonna bust burst out into singing and dancing out of nowhere you, like, do a you might as, you might as well look what i'm saying is you might as well you might as well celebrate how unrealistic it is yeah you can really push it to the limit. yeah one of my friends that's not to say they school. don't that's not to say they don't because the choreography is just as good the cinematography is just as good but the characterization in this I think is better than the original because oh. I actually cared about the relationship. At oh, okay. Hand. The original fleshes out the conflict between white kids born to immigrants and Puerto Ricans who are immigrants. It nailed the conflict between them. It nailed like where hatred in particular comes from with these specific groups through the songs, through the dialogue. And it was more mature about it than most movies nowadays. And I like that Spielberg kept those themes in particular with this. It stands out a lot more from any other movie about race or uh, just prejudice in general. But Ansel Elgore and I don't know how to pronounce her name, Rachel Ziegler or Let something me see. like that. Ziegler? Not the not Maddie Ziegler, the dancer or anything. No, no, like that. but I think it's the same. Maddie Ziegler is the YouTube singer, right? I don't know. She was a YouTube cover singer, and then she submitted an audition video to Spielberg, and she got the role out of, like, thousands of other girls. That's crazy. Rachel and for Ziegler, Ziegler? Yeah. Something yeah. like that? Yeah. She can sing. Like, she uh, had me in chills every time she sang Tonight. And look, Elgor has a lot of rumors going around about him. I don't know if they're true or not, but I judging really his think. performance, he is miles above the original guy. He's nowhere near as dopey or naive, but he still has the optimistic side of trying to be, like, trying to bridge the gaps between the Montagues and Capulets, kind of like Romeo in the first one. He still falls into the same 
traps, and the movie explores that very nicely. But in the original movie, I couldn't find, I couldn't figure out what it was that made Tony and Maria fall in love with each other. In this one, mm -hmm. because they actually take enough time to spend time with each other as a couple, I actually bought into it. Yeah. And yeah. I appreciated the side characters much more this time around because the actors were... They still had the same over-the-top uh, acting style as the original. Like, the the all-white Jets have that, that fancy Bronx accent that's well, just... And musicals kind of lend themselves a little bit to overacting. Like, anything derived from theater all, For sure. all, will always have that But it felt court. warranted. It yeah. felt like it was realistic in the world that Spielberg was creating. Yeah, I mean, the main conflict of Oklahoma is the cowboys don't like the farmers. <laughs> that's the movie. Yeah, like, you, you know, don't need... Like, South Pacific is... Oh no, we're in a war, but we're in love. Like, that's. The... Yeah, well, and speaking of like 2021 musicals, mine was Annette. That movie was bonkers. What? The that was. Time I... That was bonkers for sure. The first time I watched it, I was like, I don't even know if I liked it because I don't understand what I just saw. So I watched it a second time. That's. And serious? when I watched it the second time, I, I was definitely in a better headspace because I went in totally blind the first time. I knew pretty so much nothing. I. So. I didn't know what to expect, but once I kind of had an idea for what this was going to be, and I went back in going, okay, now I kind of have an idea of what they're maybe going for. Let's watch it again with, like, knowing the limitations of this work. I really liked it. I thought it was, like, weird and fun and really imaginative, and the second time I watched it, I really understood and I really appreciated how they used the puppet for the daughter it made sense thematically. <laughs> it made sense yeah. thematically, and it made sense also, like, personally, I just think it made sense, too, like, technically. Like, you're gonna so have this puppet did. being swung yeah. around there. You probably can't take a three-year-old and swing him around I in the air. I watched this movie. What What is it supposed to be about, even? <laughs> okay. Let me... Like, because I... It's like if Adam Driver murdered his child and joined a cult. That's what I define it. <laughs> no, no, no. That's not what happened. I just... I don't get it. He didn't cult. murder his what child. He murdered his child. At the end of the... At the end of the... He's credits, in prison. No, at the end of the movie, they're all walking in black cloaks and chanting and during the credits. Well, during the credits, yeah. But I think so he freaking weird. The oh, I didn't stick around for the credits. But, like, yeah, I think what strange. the movie is, to me, what the movie's about is, you know, Adam Driver's character, Henry, Henry McHenry, and I think a lot of it is, like, his entitlement and just the way he treats the people around him getting increasingly more out of control to the point where it destroys his life and everyone around him. Pretty okay. much. And I think that especially with the daughter being played by a puppet for most of the movie, I think has more to do with how the parents see her, especially how Adam Driver sees her. Oh, that was and I how okay. he sees yeah. her, especially for because the movie, I think, kind of leans a little bit, not t entirely, but a little into his perspective, I think. Yeah. And I think, like, Marion Cotillard's character... I think to an extent also doesn't really see her daughter as like a full-fledged person yet because she's still so young mm. but Adam Driver's character I don't think ever sees the daughter as like a human being until he loses her it's when he realizes mm. he's never going to see her again she's old enough to tell him off and tell him how she feels and she walks away from him that he kind of realized like he's like shocked into realizing this is a person not mm. an object like he uses her like an object for his own personal gain for the whole movie until finally he literally can no longer control her mm. and now she's a real person to him and it takes that long and it takes mm. that much shaking him into reality for him to really realize what he's truly lost and what he's actually done yeah and like how badly he's fucked up but it's too late at that point point. and what you were saying about koti are not even uh, acknowledging her daughter that way because in the last song from what I can remember the daughter actually slams the mom for like using her to like get back at him from yeah. beyond the grave which, exactly um, yeah because that's how she acts like that's how the ghost when the, her ghost comes back she talks about like I will use my daughter to haunt you so she's using her daughter as a conduit to get revenge on her husband. Which is weird, because she wasn't really that bad of a character until that happened. Well, and I don't even think that makes her a bad character, necessarily, because I think that that kind of reflects how, even before that, like, yes, she loves her daughter, but we don't ever really see her... Like, I don't know, I think a lot of it has to do with, like, she is kind of passive, right? Like, she kind of goes along with a lot of things up until the point that um, they're on this boat, and then he's drunk, and, like... <laughs> 
And also, I like, though, that when she dies, it's kind of questionable to what extent it was really an accident or really planned. That's true. It's really messy. It's hard to kind of tell. And I think that was sort of the point, is that it doesn't necessarily... And also, too, that it doesn't really matter whether he went onto the boat intending to kill her or not. The result is the same. Pretty much. Like, she's still dead. Like, there's nothing you can do about it. And if he wasn't such a fucking mean drunk... Maybe this wouldn't have happened, right? Like, yeah. maybe if he had seen his wife and his daughter as people and treated the people around him like, you know, human beings, mm. he'd be in a different position. Well, how, could that, well, how could play. that be? Well, how could that be? They love each other so much. Yeah, they love each other so much. And they sing about it, and they have sex. <laughs> and this was the year, honestly, between House of Gucci and Annette, this was the year of directors making Adam Driver eat pussy on screen. <laughs> I don't really know what it was. Between the girls and like House of Gucci. Oh God, yeah. And Annette. Oh. Like, what the fuck, man? And, like, I, I don't know. Well, it's just one of those. Timothy things. Chalamet didn't even get any. <laughs> Timothy Chalamet didn't get any, and Adam Driver got more than maybe he should have. Oh, um, oh my God. But like, between House of Gucci and Annette, it was just like, do you want to watch Adam Driver go down on on singers? And I'm like, yeah, okay. I'm here for that, okay. Uh, see, I always wondered what musical porn would look like, and this wasn't what I thought <laughs> it would be. Annette is apparently what musical porn looks like. <laughs> all right, so, so we'll go with Nikki and then Tyler. Give me your top five movies of the year. Top five of all of them. I'll give you a minute there, and Tyler. Well, it, it'll be pretty obvious with the conversation, too. Adam Driver's my favorite actor, so I see pretty much everything that comes out that he's in. Okay. So I think The Last Duel really was my top movie of the year, just because oh. I, I just I really liked it. I don't get to see a lot of these like big kind of historical epics anymore. There just aren't quite as many. Yeah. I thought it was for what it was and what it was trying to do. I think the other thing too for the last duel that I really appreciated is that it really had I think a sense of identity. It knew what it wanted to be and what it wanted to say. Like it was like this is how we want our movie to look. Like it didn't feel confused about what it was trying to do to me. That yeah, that that part's fair. And I think that some movies have a bit of an identity crisis of what they're trying to say or like the themes don't fit. But I thought that, like, even if, you know, everyone didn't like maybe the Rashomon style of different perspectives, I thought it made sense with the kind of movie they were trying to make and the story they were trying to tell. Um, I also thought the acting was good. I thought the costumes looked good. I thought the movie, the cinematography was really nice. I thought it looked like it was pretty much exclusively filmed on location. Like, it really... Ridley Scott does that all the time. Yeah, and so I thought that, like, it looked really like authentic in that sense like everything looked really great oh for sure and i thought the acting was really good i liked that they didn't do accents they didn't try to sound french they didn't mm. try to make the dialogue too hard or sound medieval they made it sound a little more formal to keep it in line with mm-hmm. the aesthetic yeah but it wasn't to the point where you couldn't understand what was being said and that's not like a, a shade on the green knight because i think the green knight would come in a second for me but just that the dialogue was more accessible for a medieval period piece in The Last Duel than it was in yeah, Green Knight. For so sure. it's easier to understand. Um, and yeah, I really loved it, and I think it should have gotten more attention. So I would say, yeah, The Last Duel is my number one. The Green Knight is number two, because that movie was incredible. Oh. Um, I think my number three would probably be Pig. Oh. Yes. Because that movie yes. was yeah. like, that kind of left me. And then I think number four would be Minari. Mm, really? That was really good, mm. yeah. And then Annette okay. would maybe be number five. And then House of Gucci is a close six because I did enjoy it and I had a lot of fun with my friends watching it, but I don't think it's nearly as good as a lot of, like, technically as a lot of other movies that came out this year, but I enjoyed it, right? So for me, the difference is... Yeah, for sure. You know what I mean? Like, a movie can be technically amazing, but if I'm bored out of my fucking mind, I would rather watch the movie with a bunch of problems in it that's fun. See, that was that's kind my of, approach. That's kind of how I felt about The Last Duel. Like, everything you said was absolutely true. The production value was good. The act Acting, for the most part, was good. I felt like Matt Damon wasn't the right fit for that part. See, I was actually really impressed with his performance because I felt like he played almost three different characters because everybody's perspective on him is so different. That was kind of what got that was kind of what got to me. I did I, enjoy, like I did enjoy how campy and over the top Ben Affleck was. As the <laughs> ben Affleck was so like evil. I loved how Ben Affleck just did not give a shit. Yeah, he, so he was like an asshole. He knew he was an asshole. He didn't give a fuck that he was an asshole. Is it, I liked it. Is it Natalie Comer? That's Jodie Comer. Jodie Comer. She was she was the best part, like everybody she pointed was great. out. She was great. It's just the Rashomon style for me, like once you see one perspective of a character and then it turns out to be the exact opposite, it is technically clever. But at the same time, like, this one person 
I wanted more than one person to root for, and without spoiling anything, the end result is that the person who's not really doing the fighting, just doing the waiting, in, ang in anxiety, mind you, like the last duel itself at the very end, it's is, worth the is worth the price of admission. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I didn't like the rest of the action beforehand. I thought it was too up close and shaky that I really couldn't tell what was going on. Stockman said the action was so good, and I had he's usually a good judge of action movies. I don't understand where his head was. Well, there, I think but... I thought the action was good, but I thought like and I, I see what you mean about like, you know, I want wish there was more than one character to root for, but for me I think it works in the movie's favor because of what the movie's trying to say about the culture at the time and our culture now with regards to like how we treat women and how we treat victims of sexual assault. Well, I knew that's and what so, they were going for. Well, and I think it be... pulled it off well, because I think that the way that they start out the movie, they start with Jean de Carreau's perspective, Matt Damon's perspective, and yeah. I think that works well because if you're going into the movie not knowing it does multiple perspectives, that's the perspective you kind of would assume you would get. Probably. Is the husband who's going to bravely fight on his wife's behalf. Like, it fits that traditional sort of narrative that people kind of expect. And then it changes, and it goes, well, maybe, like, he sees himself that way, but, like, maybe... He's also an asshole who's complicit in this there system. Just some Maybe things... the systemic way that like men in France in the 14th century treat women is the problem, and it's not True. because and it's not because Jacques Legree is some uniquely horrible guy. It's because the culture around them encourages this behavior. Like that's foreshadowed in the movie. Well, yeah, and, that like, that's part... part of the whole thing. And I think it and for me, I thought it worked really well, just because I think it had a sort of. It, it, it portrayed the nuances of that, right? Like, I think that what they do with Jacques Legree is especially good in that we see from his perspective that he doesn't even really understand he's done anything wrong. And I think that that was a good thing to add because it shows that, like, like sexual assault isn't just evil people scheming in the shadows to, like, kidnap people off the street. It can be people you trust and, like, your friends and people who don't even know they're doing anything wrong because the culture around them is so See, driver's, disjointed. The driver's perspective, I think, conveyed what you said yeah. perfectly. It's just that, just from a filmmaking perspective, there are some scenes that were in Damon's head that were there, but at the very end of the movie, in Comer's position, weren't there at all, and... Yeah. Like, some of those scenes not being there made sense, but there were other key moments where I felt like you could have maybe provided some subtler hints that maybe he was a bit of a jackass. Kind of like what they did yeah. with Driver, where they show some redeeming aspects of him, but they also show the stuff that we know we're going to find out about him eventually. Yeah. I, th I definitely think the movie has its issues. Like, I think the beginning's a little messy and a little bit, like confusing like at first I didn't I think in retrospect it made more sense but it should have made more sense in the moment like I shouldn't have to think back and go oh yeah okay for the beginning to feel solid but I would still call it my number one movie of the yeah. year just because I think it was so impressive technically and I really enjoyed the film and you don't get a lot of movies like this that no. true. it was kind of a treat true. right like yeah. it's something different and then the other movies too like the green knight gorgeous great acting really artistic just fun to look at Pig and Minari were both really good. Minari like made me cry. Pig made me cry. Pig, Pig did made that, me cry. Pig did that to me. Was it during the dinner? It was at the end of the movie. See, it like was... Like, the very end when, like, we're kind of figuring out everything that's happened and, like, the pig has died. And, like, the fact that the pig died. Sorry yeah. for the spoilers, but the fact that the pig died. We're gonna put spoilers, like, in the title. Yeah, we're gonna put spoilers. It's gonna be called Dune and the Last Duel Discussion. Dune, the last duel featuring Pig. Why possibly, yeah. Oh, uh, but yeah, that's a good top five. For sure. Yeah, I got yeah. some good ones in there. Minari's a surprising one. Minari, I really liked it, but I think that's also because like I tend to like sort of understated character stuff. Mm. Like I don't need there to be like a big crazy thing for it to be interesting. Like I just thought the acting in Minari was really good. It was. I thought that like it the was grandma, the oh, grandma. The totally grandma totally earned she totally earned that Oscar fair and square. Oh yeah. And like I think that the other thing with Minari that I liked is like I like movies and I was talking about this with Josh, like I think with Marvel movies the stakes are too big. I like it when the stakes are kind of small and personal. They're and more like, relatable. And yeah, and really mm -hmm. relatable. Like the family losing their like produce stand. Like that's heart wrenching because yeah. you know how hard they work for it and you see like just how much shit they've had to put up with just to lose it all. Like, oh my god, that was heart wrenching. 
and like the grandmother being sick and I thought she was gonna die and I was so sad I was like oh no don't kill the grandmother True. like I was really upset that the grandma was gonna die and like I just thought it was also a good portrayal of the immigrant agricultural experience because like that's something that like my grandparents did they did it before obviously the time period in Minari because this would have been in like the 1950s yeah when my but, when my grandpa came to Canada I think he did like tobacco farms in Alberta yeah, or something like that yeah my grandparents came from Portugal and they were orchard farmers in Niagara so like just seeing kind of a general representation of that sort of you know you come from another country you're trying to make this life better for your family but like it is fucking hard and you're working your ass off and your kids are working their ass off and like things don't always go your way and then just all of the the shit that swirls around this family where you're like jesus christ you feel so bad for them oh for sure but then at the end that there's still kind of that glimmer of hope like the grandma's still there they still have the minari growing like the symbol of the thematic symbol the plant right the the piece of their homeland your culture your identity that sticks with you that you get to keep mm, yeah. through all of this and like your family and I just thought that it was one of those movies where I just I really liked it because it was small, because it was contained to just this family. It's not, there's no crazy special effects, there's no weird twists. It's just a story about a family, and it was really well written and really well acted. I feel like everybody deep down has one of those movies that they love. Usually, yeah. like the most popular choices are like a Ghibli movie, like Totoro or something along those lines. Some people might go with Nomad Land because, again, it's a slice of life story. That's I mean, seen. I'd go Good Will Hunting. There's that too, that's me. and you can also list other examples like uh, Florida Project mm, or that's wonderful. Roma in particular, because that uh, that I feel is a prime. Has example. anyone seen the trailer for Red Rocket yet? I'm not sure no. I want to go see that. They told the director of Florida Project. I know, and I'm not, based on, like, the subject matter, here's the thing, I don't even get sketchy with subject matter, but this just seems yeah, weird. Yeah, there's some even, red flags already raised. It just seems weird even for him, and this is coming from the guy who made Tangerine. So what are your top five of the year, Tyler? <laughs> okay, so my number five is the best movie I saw at TIFF this year. It hasn't technically come out in theaters yet, but like I saw it at Roy Thompson Hall in 2021. I count it. And I just had an entire, I had a huge smile on my face throughout the majority of Zhang Yimou's One Second, a movie that was supposed to come out sooner on other festivals, but it got pulled at the last minute. And there's this rumor going around that it got pulled by the Chinese government for censorship issues. Okay. I, Don't here's the thing. I, I can't say for sure. The editing is so tight that allegedly they have flat out said that like two minutes were edited out. They didn't say why. And for all I know, it could just be a rumor above all else. But it's another movie that goes along the line of what you just said about a movie that has very small but still relatable stakes. For those who don't know, it's kind of like Cinema Paradiso where it's about people who have this shared oh, this love of movies and going to the cinema. The opening intro before the movie started was from Yimu talking about how people in his community would walk for hours to go to the closest movie theater place and stay there all night just to escape their troubles. And this movie emphasizes that so well. It's about this one town that goes to the cinema as if it were a church. The owner's name is literally Mr. Movie. He's one of the best characters <laughs> okay. I've seen all year because the overall plot of the movie centers around them trying to restore this damaged print that the delivery guy fucked up so that they could see their movie that night. And when they're all helping out as best as they can, they screw up the slightest bit. Mr. Movie will go Arlie Ermy on your ass. He will roast you as hard as possible to for you to get the big picture. And it is, it's so funny. It's so worth it because you understand even though he's belittling these people, it's so he can provide them a good and a service that they greatly appreciate. One that he takes a shit ton of pride in because mm -hmm. you would know, you guys would know for sure, putting up a movie for people is not as easy as it sounds. <laughs> no, it's not. And there, it's... It's technically a backdrop for what this one guy and an orphan girl have in terms of their own plot that I don't want to spoil because it is pretty mundane and basic for a film like this, but it's so simple, but it's filmed in such a beautiful cinematic way. There are glances, there are entire shots that feel reminiscent of Lawrence of Arabia mm. or a Western. There's actually one moment where our main character gets stared down by a couple people 
who want to rob them, and they do the Sergio Leone stare downs. <laughs> yeah. There's a cutaway shot where a character, where it's just a character's hand pulling out a knife. They stare down each other, and I don't want to spoil what the end result of that fight is, but it was hilarious. It was impactful, and that's the great thing about it, one second. It was just, it was a beautiful movie to watch. I'll go with my number five. My number five is The Rescue. I'm putting a documentary on this list. Okay. Uh, it's about. You can do that. Uh, the kids who got stuck underground tunnels. Right. Um, oh, in 2019. Yeah. The documentary is incredible. Okay. Um, they recreated a whole bunch of footage. They've they've basically created like you've read the news reports and you could read the Wikipedia article. Yeah. But like watching the movie is an experience. Because you're sitting wow. there and you're like, you get to see the backstory, you get to see the characters, you get to see all the people involved in it. And like they focus on these five dudes who are the main divers. And, like, they did it as a hobby, and it was a weekend thing. And the way they do the graphics, and it's just one of the best put-together documentaries I've ever seen. I'm a huge fan of documentaries, and I know I say documentary because it sounds cool. Uh, <laughs> but I just, like, I'm like, this is really good. It's from National Geographic, who did Free Solo, which is also incredible if you have not seen Free Solo. Okay. Um, that one's about scaling a mountain, and that okay. one is... Uh, Oh boy, it's really good. Oh, um, I'm sure it is. Yeah. I've heard good stuff. Um, we didn't get a lot of documentaries this year. So. We got a couple. You guys played uh, The Truffle Hunters, which was a really good documentary for me personally. In fact, last week, I actually had a truffle in my hands. Though you have no idea how hard those things are to come by, especially yeah. like during the winter season well, right now. Okay. And I got to... That's true. Yeah, yeah that's no. true. See, I thought see, that was weird that when I went to see Pig, there was a trailer for the Truffle Hunters, and I was like, is see, this like a truffle? No, no. <laughs> every summer, every summer, there's a trend. This summer was movies about pigs and truffles. The yeah. other one was oh. Call Me By Your Name knockoff with like Summerland and such, and then yeah, the year yeah, yeah. before was this. It's just like I didn't every, see that. Summerland was cute. It was really cute. It was like just romance set on an island, but it was pretty much Call Me By Your Name, just that, that was it. Uh... <laughs> You know, they couldn't stay together because, I guess, reasons. I guess she's only there for the summer and she couldn't come back. I it's don't like know. Grease. <laughs> it's like the opening to Grease. Wow. It was the prequel. Oh, uh, but yeah, that's my number five. I, I think there, it was like, it was an hour and a half. It was very impactful. It wasn't like overly dramatic like you expect, like one of those documentaries to be like, and then they were stuck in the tunnels and everyone's like, hey. and there's that, there wasn't a false sense of excitement. It was just like, here's the story. If you're engaged, it's for you. And I liked it. We that's, got at, uh, that's good. We got number four. My number four, I he'll he won't be surprised that I have this on my list. It's the first movie that we saw together this year, A Quiet Place Two. Surprise. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> Look, um, the one thing I will say about A Quiet Place Part Two is that there are many sequences, plots, and character-driven moments that do feel very reminiscent of the original movie. And sometimes that can be a little bit distracting, but at the same time, they reshuffle them with different characters in a position that someone else would have been in before. Like, for example, the mom is in the position where she has to care for this newborn child that she is extremely scared shitless over protecting because she had already lost one before the events of the movie. In this one, Noah Jupe as the son is put in that position, which he doesn't want because he knows good and hell well that he's a fucking knob. And <laughs> unfortunately, he still is. But he has gotten a little bit smarter. I will give him that. And part of that is being, being given this responsibility where he has to keep his eyes and ears open as much as possible. And that's... That's one of the things I like more about this one than the first, is that the kids have more opportunities to grow and to accept more responsibility with the new circumstances mm. that they're in. Millicent Simmons is given so much more to do in this film, and I, and, I, and I still liked her a lot in the first movie. The first movie was all about her overcoming grief and guilt, and she did a great job here, but in this one, she's technically the main character. Yeah. She drives a lot of stuff forward, and she has to do things with or without the help of the other adults. Mm. And she, uh, in my opinion, did a great job of showing the maturity that some children face in such difficult scenarios. Killian Murphy as someone He's who... He's good. Killian Murphy did a Fantastic. great job. Even, even though Emily Blunt wasn't in it as much as the first one, she still has a presence yeah. to her. She still has some great moments, like that one moment where she has the revolver and mm. she 
in a Western era type of scene, she has to fire at the creature. Kind of, do you remember that one bit? Yeah, I remember that bit. Okay. Yeah, I, went, I was there. I saw it with you. <laughs> that doesn't mean you remember all of it. I remember that the one kid makes a stupid decision, but immediately reverses it. So that made me happy. He goes to like make something. He's like, no, I shouldn't. And I'm like, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, he actually did learn one or two things. And so did John Krasinski, because I would argue this is a significantly better directed mm. movie. He has a lot of those Spielberg wonders where the camera is so meticulously positioned yeah. in every single sequence. The creature effects were just as good as before. There's a hell of a lot more world building when we get to learn what the other survivors are, what their communities are operated as. There's this one group that's a little bit more feral versus one that without spoiling anything, kind of got a little bit lucky with their circumstances. And it's just, it's just as visually told as before, even though there's technically a little bit more talking, but without spoiling anything, there are excuses as to why there are more, there are more times where they get to talk. There are so much, there's so much you can dissect about this one basic blockbuster movie and that's the great thing that i love about it i really wish i had more ways of describing it right now but mm. there's so many other good movies this year that we'll throw out the rest of your top five and uh what are your other top five just out there well my number three is the green knight okay yeah. we talked about that one extensively yeah great movie. what do you got to, to talk about well to talk about the stuff that we haven't mentioned at green knight like david lowry's direction is some of the best he's ever done it makes me much more excited for his Peter Pan remake that he's doing next oh, yeah. year. I, I hope if he brings the same like mm. visual sensibility to he it, better. it's going to be incredible. He kind of did that with his Pete Dragon remake, which um, thank God that got remade because the original was shit. I didn't like either. Am I in the, am I in the minority here? <laughs> I I doubt it. Pete's Dragon just isn't for me. I think at the end of the day, I that's like totally the, fair. The original one I saw like once as a kid and I don't remember, and I think I saw like a scene from the Lowry version. So I think the Green Knight's the first Lowry like movie I've seen from front to back, like completely in one sitting. For me, it's this and a, a ghost story, and I wasn't really that. I thought I was gonna love a ghost story, but for whatever reason, it didn't click with me. We'll as have much to get a copy of the Green Knight and do a commentary on it, the three of us, because uh, yeah. that would be. I'm sure, we have a lot to say. The Green Knight was a gorgeous. I <laughs> saw like, it with my friend, right? I want to get a 4K. I want to get a 4K Blu-ray player and put that in and see. Oh, that's gorgeous. But that's as gorgeous. you mentioned before, the cinematography was fantastic, mostly on location and in camera. The special effects were great. It's insane that Ralph Innocent was covered in all of that makeup and oh, aesthetics. Yeah. You can do and some that, pretty incredible stuff. Oh, what's yeah. also amazing is that he's not really that tall. He was standing on a stool for most of it to be taller than Patel. <laughs> you don't really need to do much to like make true. that stuff work, right? Like yeah, if you can't true. see the stool, then exactly. And you know. Dev Patel. Some of his best work. Oh, he blew it. He blew me away. Which is insane, because so he good. plays a hard character to like at the very beginning. But that is kind of the point. He has to grow and mature in yeah, such a short amount of time. He's a scoundrel. Also, Dev Patel did the personal history of David Field, and that movie was not great, except for his performance. Well, I felt like there were other more impressive things about that movie than him. Till yeah. Swinton just yelled donkeys, and that was mostly the movie. But, like, Dev Patel was good in it. It's just yeah, but the Hugh Laurie was in David Copperfield, and he stole every scene he was in. <sighs> just the story could have been better. Uh, hey, I don't disagree with you on that. But, yeah, Green Knight, we've talked to death about this yeah. one. Uh, yeah. I've already talked to death about my number two, which is West Side Story. I yeah. love old-fashioned musicals, and... Mm -hmm. This is the best musical I've seen since Mary Poppins Returns. Not I still in the prefer. Heights. I still haven't seen In the Heights, <laughs> and part of that was because the negative press just turned me off completely, and it just it didn't matter what I would say. Somebody was going to nag me about it, and I wouldn't. I, I'm more interested in talking about the quality of the film, not the politics that go around, along with it. I still do want to watch Tick, Tick, Boom just to see how good of a director Lin-Manuel is because I've heard mostly good things about that one. Mainly how Andrew Garfield apparently is a really good singer, which I would not have anticipated from him. Hmm. I just want to see how, with all of his musical experience, how Miranda can craft a musical number. Hmm. Whether or not like he has that much studio control or not, because apparently the editing was a little end, hmm. but... Fair. I'm still looking forward to it. So then what's your number one, then? Is it Dune? My number one is Denis Villeneuve's Dune Part 1. 
There you go. I have the most opposite list then. What's your list? So at my number That's four, fine. I've got Jungle Cruise. I, I didn't love see that. this movie. I didn't see no it. No one else has seen this movie, but it's fun. Oh, I saw it. It's, at, it's an hour and 40 minutes. It's an adventure boat movie. No longer than that. And it's just a delight to watch. It made me so happy. I've watched it four times. I love this movie. I'm going to pick up the 4K Blu ray. It's just. It's one of those movies I had a great time with. Okay. It has its character flaws and it has some silly moments, but it takes inspiration from Indiana Jones and it's got a little bit of that Tomb Raider-ish. And it's everything. It's just so much darn fun. And it's got a little bit of a Pirates yeah. thing too because it's another movie based off of a theme park ride. See, that's why I didn't see it because I was like, I don't know if I want to see like, I, wanted, right? like, I wanted to give it a chance just because I wanted to see Dwayne Johnson and Emily Blunt kick some ass. They're so good. Together. Once in a while you huh. get that. Like, Blunt and Johnson do have really good uh, comedic back and forth with each other and that was probably the reason that kept me watching. I was literally the only person in my theater because it had been out for a couple weeks or so. But they were really the only things I could recommend about it. I didn't like the direction where, for starters, there was way too much CGI. Well, I know that's a big complaint yeah. with movies nowadays. It's a Disney but, ride movie. I but think even, that's kind of to be expected. Even when you compare it to a Disney or Marvel movie, it still feels like a lot of overload. I didn't... I like the idea of Jesse Plemons as this Nazi type of villain, but I wanted him to do more than just speak in a goofy accent. Paul Giamatti was great, too. He's just this guy in the who two wants minutes, money. In the two yeah. minutes that he's in, which felt like a huge waste of But, like, the opening, I like it how, like... The Rock needs his boat. They want to take his motor. They're gonna, they're gonna. So, so he gets someone to give him money, sort of like a new hope ish. We get a little bit of that in there, and then all of a That's sudden true. they're out on this boat. But before we see that, we see him like putting up this fake cruise where he has to have like hire people to play the native. That the natives, was the best part of the. And movie. we have him like putting up like he he has a pet cheetah just to run along, just so people can be thrilled. And they all want their money back, and they're bored. And by the end of this, like he finds his purpose, his meaning. We learn a lot more about him, too, at the end. And I think it's got a pretty decent finale. Like, it's cliche for sure, but I just had a blast with it. I had See, so much fun. The opening theme park attraction scene was the best part for me because it had that self-awareness to it. It had Johnson playing to his comedic roots. Mm. But, like, I thought the action scenes, on top of being too generic, were so shaky and quick-cutting that I couldn't really tell who was punching who and where what was going on. It's the funnest I had watching Jesse, movie all year long. Like I said, Jesse Plemons is a good idea for a villain, but he doesn't really interact with the heroes until like an hour and a half into the movie, which yeah. it's mainly just him yelling at his cohorts, and you can only watch that for so long. I like Jesse Plemons. I like Jack Whitehall, just not in this movie, and it's not... People gave Whitehall shit for playing a gay guy when he's not. That's not the issue I have with the movie. It's one scene. <laughs> it's called acting. For, and like Honestly, with the exact same script, if you gave this to a gay actor, nothing would change. That actor wouldn't be funny. And if I'm being honest, if, if, he, was, if he was really gay and you were telling this some of the more stereotypical aspects, I wouldn't call that any better. Quite the contrary. My problem was the jokes just weren't funny for him. And it felt like he was on a leash because usually he's a lot better at improving some really dark shit. And he's fantastic in Bad Education or um, Mock the Week. But yeah, I, as a whole, I thought Jungle Cruise was just okay. I had the best time watching this. Uh, then after that, I've got The Suicide Squad. That's another one that it was on my list, but I didn't see it. I love this movie. I, I, I do want to see it. It's I would so like to good. watch it. I just haven't yeah, had a chance to watch it. There you go. I didn't. I didn't <laughs> love it as much as most people, but it was good, and it definitely so it makes fun. it does make up for the original David well, Ayer. I do just think it's really funny how it like not even five years they had to remake Suicide Squad because right? it was so bad. Look, that to okay. me is just okay. funny. I like the original Suicide Squad. It it's has, not the it best, moments. but it has some fun moments. I think that Deadshot is a really great character. I think that Harley Quinn is really strong. True. The Joker is weird. I think I like the simplistic plot. I just I hate but your leader. I character. have watched that movie so many times. It is one of those movies. No one's surprised love. by that. I like it very much. She like I just I can't get into the Jared Leto Joker. I hate That's it. That's fair. I hate it so much. And also like there were too many changes. And I think that Jared Leto was also one of the weird parts of House of Gucci, where I think if they had toned him back or replaced him with someone else, I think the movie would have been better. 
I don't even understand what annoying. was the point of that. Like, I know he everyone... He was the comic relief character. That was his only role. Yeah, but His still... role was to be a punching bag to make jokes at because the other characters weren't that funny. Because I think... they're inherently not very funny. Like, I think it's also because... Because weren't meant to be funny. I think it's because... Paolo was the black sheep in real life. Well, but... yeah, but that's what I mean. Like, they took the real life kind of black sheep of the family and then they amped it up to like a comical level just so they could make fun of him. And my problem, I don't care if I'm a raging SJW, I don't give a shit. This is part of my problem with it, is they put Jared Leto in prosthetics and like costume stuff to make him look fat just to make fun of him the whole movie. And to me, that just I felt was gonna like, say I don't think he was that big in real life. Well, yeah, and it just felt mean spirited. You know what I mean? Like it, it's like if you want to have a character to be your comic relief character, and they're gonna be the only character in the movie who's even slightly fat, and then you're gonna take Jared Leto and put him in a fat suit, which is it weird. Just you would feels him. so weird. Like why wouldn't you just hire an actor who has a body type more similar? To what you're looking for, the way they do with every other character. Jared Leto would put on those pounds just to get there. I'm just kind of surprised he didn't. Well, yeah, and like, even still, it would have been nice for them to. It's like if you're gonna have a fat character who exists solely to be a punching bag comedically for you to make fun of the whole movie, get someone at who least can take, get an actor. Get someone who can take it. Well, and that's so at least get an actor who has that body type, so it doesn't feel like you wanted Jared Leto to play a funny character and then decided the only character in the movie who's gonna be even slightly implied or shown to have any extra weight on them be the character who's like the goofiest most ridiculous stupid idiot on the planet like it just felt like he was the one character that they really cranked up his negative elements like they gave patrizia compared to how she was in real life a lot more sympathy that, than maybe she deserved that's to be expected even but even still like that's fine but like if you're gonna do that for every character but Paolo, it feels targeted. It so just wait, feels like, a little targeted. Are you saying they make him out to be, like, worse than fucking Jeremy Irons? Like, like a worse person? Just in, just, uh, just a negative image in general compared well, to, like, Jeremy Irons I think Irons he has a more negative image than them because at least Jared... Oh, sorry. At least Jeremy Irons and Al Pacino's characters were given a sense <clears> of, like, respect, if that makes sense. Like, they weren't meant to be laughed at. They were assholes, but you weren't meant to laugh at them. Paolo was, like, so pathetic, almost. And okay, they made okay. him, like, such a laughing stock that it's, like, the other characters at least had some kind of redeeming quality. Like, they're shrewd businessmen. They know what they're doing. Like, they're they're put together. They're in control, even if they're dicks. Everyone's smart except Paolo. Yeah, so it's right? basically, yeah. It's like Paolo is, like, stupid and he can't design and he has a stupid accent and like, he, like all this shit, right? Like, they just really, and I don't know why that he's bothered not, he me so much. He doesn't even sound Italian. They couldn't even get he that right. He sounds like, it's a me, a Paolo. Like, but like, my question <laughs> is, why did they put I think, Jared uh, Leto's terrible accent in the room with like, actual Al Pacino? <laughs> that I don't get. Here's the, like, uh, one thing we can't, one thing we can all agree on, Jared Leto sounds more Italian than Chris Pratt. <laughs> <laughs> he I think should Jared, play Mario. Leto, Jared Leto. That's what I'm gonna say. Jared Leto go. should have played Mario. He's probably gonna be Luigi in the movie. No, uh, Charlie Day is Luigi. <laughs> Who? Wait, Charlie what? Day is Luigi. Oh fuck off! Like from It's Always Sunny. I'm you not know mad what? at that I'm choice. Not mad I just don't either. get it. I, I'm not I have mad to at see. Either. I would like to see Charlie Kelly. I have it's to see sunny. it. I think I just have to see it. Yeah, I would have to see. I think they just put Chris Pratt in there because he's popular because the Lego Movie. I okay. This is a conspiracy theory like off topic thing where somebody said that Chris Pratt is like a known like Christian Republican and oh, some people families. have assumed that it's possible that the reason he's doing a lot of animated voiceover stuff is because there are COVID restrictions on set and you have to be vaccinated you have to wear masks and people uh, suspect it's possible oh, that he may not be fully vaccinated I'll wait till there's a confirmation yeah, yeah I don't know if that's true but someone pointed the theory out that like it's kind of weird that he's not doing a lot of live action well, he's doing studio work but in studio work you can okay. isolate from people and be in no no he did one Here's movie and with, it was okay. terrible the Tomorrow War don't watch it he did the Tomorrow it. War he did the but when did they he film did this the Amazon War? show uh, I don't know so that's the thing is if it released this year but was it filmed prior I don't know, I don't well, know. hold on though like if that's true doesn't that mean he can't do Guardian Spree is there, or, oh, yeah, a, or the new See, form. I don't know if that's true, but I just thought it was an interesting theory. The thing is... Theory time. The thing is, the rumor about him being conservative, that's not really 100% true that's not either. A, no, but that's not a rumor. Yeah, but like, just because he's married, just because he's in-laws with the Schwarzenegger no, that's doesn't not make why. him a Republican. Which that's not why did he marry? He married uh, Arnold's daughter. Yeah. Oh. That's not why that's they said a... rumor. It has more to do with, like, 
the specific church he's affiliated with, some of the like people that he follows and interacts with. Wasn't that a rumor though media? that he went to that church? Like no, he that's never not a rumor. he never flat out said that. I don't no, know much not, about it's Chris not a rumor. Pratt, so. it's, he does go there. That's not a rumor. Imagine like he well, never flat out said my Chris thing is name, so. like imagine going to Christmas dinner and you're Chris Pratt and you have to impress Arnold Schwarzenegger. Like that's gonna be the most awkward dinner ever. That You've seen how weird. buffed up he was in the first Guardians. Hello, right? Mr. Chris. How are you? Exactly. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Pratt. <clears throat> are you treating my daughter nicely? I will get you. <laughs> yeah, well, if you're not, you're going to have the Terminator <laughs> coming after you. <laughs> and then my number one and two, which I can't decide which number one is two, yeah. uh, Titan and No Time to Die. No shocker are there. I would love to see Titan. I have not gotten a Titan chance Titan is him. about a, a woman in an accident. Yes, yeah, she gets in an accident. Didn't she has get pregnant ear- with a car? That's what I heard. She well, you know, that com- that's later in the film. Yeah. But she, she has this ear thing, so it's just like, it's this crazy world she lives in. And so, yeah, she gets pregnant with a car and then tries to abort her own child and bashes in someone's jaws with a stool and then meets a father figure person who, like, leaves her captive in a room and then has a strange alien baby. Like, that's the movie. Oh, one movie I'm going to bring up we haven't talked about yet. Did anyone else see Zola? No. Um, I almost saw it. That's the A24. It wasn't yes. really wasn't really into it. That was the first movie I saw back in a theater. The last movie I saw in a theater was in 2019. I saw Cats. And I must say, just as a quick reference, I love the movie Cats because it's so bad. And I had so much fun watching it. It was the greatest theater experience I've ever had. <laughs> I had to sit. I sat in two. Uh, I watched it in like two sittings. That's uh, fair. That's stone, fair. Uh, as stoned as I could possibly get without overdoing it. <laughs> I went with my friend. We ate a bunch of weed brownies. I shoved them in my purse. That is, we went to the theater. See, that, that is the zooted. only way. We went to the theater zooted as fuck. We got a bunch of like hot dogs and popcorn and we like piled up arms full of candy. Josh, in all seriousness, that is the the only way to watch Cats. It's the best way to watch Cats, but we went, there was me and my friend, really high, we were sitting kind of at the top of the staircase because we didn't want to be like in the middle and have to climb over people, like we didn't want to spill food, we didn't want to get anybody's way, right? We wanted to be considerate even if we were going to be intoxicated in public. Very much. We wanted to be like polite to others. So we sat at the back at the top, there was a man there with his like 10 year old daughter she's clearly the one who wanted to see it Rob, yeah. there was a couple of middle-aged it's women PG, the movie's pg yeah yeah and well and also like kids just see cats and a girl likes cats and she just wants to see it because it's a movie about cats and, and all the celebrities and yeah taylor in. swift, taylor swift yeah, yeah i can see that, taylor yeah. swift was one of the legit good things about it she was fine because i actually liked the song that she got yeah the and i do like and I do like that it's a henchwoman singing it as opposed to two random cats who are just, like, singing rumors. But yeah. singing, like, in praise the villain, that part I thought was a great tip. And, like, I don't even like Taylor Swift, but I liked how seductive her voice was. Yeah, like, she, she did especially well especially when you're was. Especially when you are a little jittery, it'll get to you. <laughs> you're high. Yeah, well, and, like... Well, the theater for Cats, when I saw it, like, cause this was the last time I saw anything in a theater until Zola this summer, right? Like, I didn't go to anything okay. in 2020. So, when we saw Cats, we were really high, we had all of our food, there was a guy with his daughter, there was, like, three, maybe four, kind of middle-aged women who were probably Andrew Lloyd Webber fans, mm. and then there was, like, a couple on a date or something. Okay. So, like, oh, the boy. theater was almost empty, and it was just us, and me and my friend were sitting there, and we're so fucking high, that when the movie starts, and the the second it, the, the DreamWorks logo started moving and the camera panned down and the weird CG started, I just started laughing. Like, and the whole time I was laughing pretty much the whole time, not because it was actually funny, but just because it was so ridiculous and I was so high. And then we, I had more weed brownies in my purse. I just kept them in a pocket. And then in the middle of the movie, we like topped back up. And by the end of it, I was like, holy shit. Like, I don't think I could have had a better theater experience. The other movie that I saw that that month, December, it was I saw The Rise of Skywalker. I had a much better time watching Cats. Cats was a far better theater experience than Rise of Skywalker. I can Rise of Skywalker imagine. has all the problems of not being a planned sequel, forced lineage, and oh, subpar the, action yeah. with a few cameos that are like, yay. Well, and my hot take, sorry for the podcast if this gets you flamed, but my hot take was that J.J. Abrams, when he started with Force Awakens, had an idea for what he wanted all three movies to be, but he didn't get to make the second one. 
So then when they brought him back to the Probably. third, but so then when they brought him back to the third, he just said, "Fuck it, I'm just gonna do what I was planning to do this whole time." But because he didn't get the second movie, he had to retcon everything. I'm gonna go that's out on the, I'm gonna like, go out on a limb and say that's. But there were so many happened. like problems with like like how is there a hidden planet that has an entire army of Death Stars because that, that Kylo probably... Ren can run across in like half an hour, but it takes the rest of them an hour to travel. Because I think what happened is J.J. Abrams wanted to do all this shit, but he didn't get to write the second part, and instead of just working with what Ryan Johnson had done and taking the L, and just saying, listen, we're just gonna try and make it make sense, he just said, no, I really want to do the thing I wanted to do, and just retconned it. But if J.J. Abrams ever stuck a landing on an ending, it'd be beautiful. Because, like, he can't end Lost... He no. can't end Star Trek movies. Doesn't it? He's like, I'm not making, I'm not making Wrath of Khan again. And then he made Wrath of Khan again. I mean, even the ending to the first Star Trek movie, they're like, oh, we're fighting on a spaceship. Oh no, danger! And I'm like, this is what we built up to a fist I'm, fight. I, I don't know if it was Lindsay Ellis or somebody else who used the term, but somebody used the term where they said J.J. Abrams is really good at that mystery box thing where he sets up. There's a mystery in the box. What's in the box? I do like but that. But he's so about bad at ending it. He's good at setting up the premise. Like, Force Awakens was good. He's Which good really at setting me... up a basic structure. He's not good at finishing things. No. It really makes... Yeah, and that's the great... That's the one thing about the mystery box that he can't solve. Like, it would be great if he left things for us to imagine for ourselves at the very end. Yeah, that's... I would go with that, And that's too. part of what made the ending of Force Awakens great, is that... Oh, is that the ending is a mystery box. What's gonna happen between Luke and Rey in the next movie? Like, that, for me, is what made it a good ending. Yeah. I mean, like, and Ray didn't need to be re- related to anyone. Exactly. And we did exactly. not get kill off. And I'm sorry, but Princess Leia doing that superhero thing was like, what the that. fuck is that? I'm fine with that. And I'm, I'm like, okay with that, too. No, but she I'm never established she had any force abilities. But at the same did time... Did you have to? I see, mean, yeah, I don't think you she need is, is that. She is, the, she is the daughter of the Chosen One. It's not like she wasn't going to be good at the force. But, like, Darth yeah. Vader doesn't even do that. Like, who does that? Like, well, no one's ever think, done that. I will give them a pass on yeah, that. Yeah, Darth Vader also has... I realize like, that no with no Carrie Fisher yeah. passing away. That's the reason I'll give them the pass for that is because there was kind of exigent circumstances that sort of affected how they could finish things and also too like it's not just how they could finish it without having the actress but like how are audiences going to feel after Carrie Fisher has died if you just like kill her her character off you know what I mean like that could be yeah but I mean they still did she doesn't have to fly through space she could do something heroic that's not flying through space I just staying alive for the sake of your rebellion is not, is not selfish, real? No, flying through space. Like, she could, like, get in a pod and launch through space. Like, you can't breathe in... You can't breathe outside space like that. Well, okay, but for me, that yeah, part doesn't really matter. that's why she really was in a matter. coma for half Yeah, I don't really give a shit about that, because to me, Star Wars is not... Like, it doesn't work by the rules of, like, actual physics. It's no. a fantasy no. movie. No, they, so they, me... they literally threw away light speed in, in, yeah, in a I, lot of these movies. It they jumped matter. through Star okay. Destroyers. So, like, what the... Like, I don't, like, I don't give what? a shit. Like, to me, I don't care about that kind of thing, because this is not a movie that ever premised itself as being grounded in, like, the laws of physics. It's a, it's space wizards. It's space wizards. Yeah. So, like, I don't care. They can do whatever crazy shit they want as long as, to me, it feels, like, emotionally or narratively satisfying. Which is so what I made, mind. Which I is what care. made Luke being the ghost at the very end. That's what, what what made that work so well. Yeah, and, like, and I actually thought that what they did with Luke made sense. Like, and especially, people gave Ryan Johnson a lot of shit. His movie's for, good. Well, and people gave See, him a lot I'm of a shit, fan. but, like, the thing is, he didn't make the decision to have Luke be, like, exiled from the rest of the cast. J.J. Abrams made that decision in The Force yeah. Awakens. And Ryan Johnson had to come up with how to make it work in such a way that, like, okay, so if Luke is disconnected from The Force, or and he's not dealing with these other characters, right? So, like, you would have to have a reason, because he's, like, the most powerful Jedi. And we know he's a good guy. We know that if he knew what was going on, he wouldn't just let this happen and let his family suffer. We know that he wouldn't do that. So there has to be a reason that he's disconnected from the Force. And if something external from him has disconnected him, it has to be a powerful enough threat to disconnect Luke Skywalker from the Force. So the only thing that's left is if he does it himself because he thinks it's what's best for everyone else. And that, to me, was like... That's, like, the only thing that really could have made sense. Not to mention... But that wasn't Ryan Johnson's decision anyway. Like, Not to mention, Luke has always... Oh, has always chosen to run away from his problems exactly. first. Like that's always been. Here's the thing, like I'm, 
I'm a big fan of the critical drinker on YouTube, but every time he shits on Ryan Johnson, that's when I just sit there and go, dude, you're overreacting. Yeah, like, I think that Ryan Johnson did what he could with what he was given, right? Because he didn't get to set up The Force Awakens, so he had to explain why Luke was gone, and he had to pick the best reason he could with Yeah, what he had. I'm not gonna lie. The idea of having a different writer and director to take what was there before and do a fresh spin on it, that's technically not a bad idea. No, well, and I think it worked I, well and I am, The Last Jedi. And I am glad that Abrams was the director of Rise of Skywalker over Colin Tremorrow, because I can't see Tremorrow having done any better. Oh, Jurat, uh, I just want to go off on a tangent. I need a Josh rant here. All right, go ahead. Jurassic World hold on, Fallen hold on, hold Kingdom. On. Once, this rant, once this rant is over, can we talk about our uh, worst of? After yeah, we can do that. Segue? Okay. okay. Jurassic World, Jurassic Park, cool movie. I like it. It's groundbreaking. Cool movie. I hate that the kids can survive the electric fence, but whatever. Jurassic World, Jurassic Park 2, whatever, it's, it's, it's still a decent little sequel. Jurassic Park 3 is ridiculous that with the pterodactyls, but Jurassic World, this is a money grab. This is not a movie, this is not an artistic yeah. expression, yeah. this is Jimmy Fallon in a bubble. This is, <laughs> this, is, this is Jimmy Buffett drinking margaritas when someone's getting crushed by a T-Rex. This is Claire running in heels with a flare and not being eaten by a T-Rex. Like, it's just, it's... It's dumb. So the second one, Fallen Kingdom, is a piece of shit. It's awful. It starts off with like, oh no, we have to save the dinosaurs because environment. And none of them make it to the ship. And then they had the, because the reason they couldn't go back to the island because, I don't know, money, they couldn't get it. And then they're stuck in a mansion and they're like, hey, let's auction a dinosaur off for $5,000. Like, does it? That's that's what a dinosaur is worth. Oh, and here's this new, and then oh, we saw that movie uh, Resident Evil and played the game. What if the dinosaurs are like the zombie dogs? And then there's a clone girl, and then and then they have to run around the mansion and they tap the feet, and it's like a horror vibe. And what if Chris Pratt doesn't care? And then what if the clone girl releases all the dinosaurs into the freaking world and says this one line that everyone's gonna love? They're alive, just like me. It's stupid. It's really, really stupid. I don't know who wrote this movie, but don't, don't. Now there's like 50 dinosaurs roaming the earth. And everyone's like, no, see the clone girl may be alive and maybe we could just shut off the gas. But now everyone's going to die because there's five freaking T-Rexes and super velociraptors running around chowing down on people. I mean, it's worse than when they're at a gas station. It's worse. <laughs> see, I mean, you, you, you say... Uh... <laughs> You say dinosaurs munching on children. I'm just thinking of the scientifically accurate Barney. Any of you guys scientifically accurate? You ever like, you ever like, seen that video on YouTube? No, but I don't think I want to. No, well, you really don't. I mean, like, stop. Hollywood needs to stop trying to make trilogies off of pre-existing trilogies. Make original movies. Do something different. Fantastic Beasts didn't work. Work at all. Too many storylines. Complete, absolute nonsense. Yeah. Like the best character got their memory wiped at the end of it. Jurassic Jurassic World is literally a cash grab because you remember that thing. Yeah. Make an original movie. I'm sorry, you're old and white and have no imagination. Oh, for and if you don't want to do that, quit your fucking job and let someone who knows how to make a movie do it. <laughs> Do you need some Pepsi? You no, I just rant a lot. This is my Josh right. rant. We always do it on the show. Trust me, this is totally normal for him. It's very normal. No, I know. I just need to make sure you're <laughs> I really mean, yeah. or I something. do kind of miss this side of you, if I'm being Yeah, the Josh honest. rants are legendary. <laughs> okay. Well, Worst think... of the year. What What do you... I, I want... I want to... I will get I will get to Army of Dead, because that movie deserves to be... See, I, I will help you with that. See, this year I didn't watch as many new releases because a lot of my beginning of my year was sort of me rewatching the same things repeatedly because I had to write about them for my master's paper, so I was, like, really preoccupied with That's that. Um, but I think, okay, this movie is, like, I don't want to call it the worst of the year. It's the worst thing that I saw, but it was a movie that frustrated me because I felt like it had potential, but it got oh. so lost along the way that I don't know what happened. The Woman in the Window. <laughs> with um Amy Adams yeah oh I was thinking of Winchester no because I think Amy Adams was good in the role and in theory there's nothing wrong with the story like I get that it's really similar to Rear Window but I don't yeah. think that's inherently a problem because you can do something different with it like you don't have to do Rear Window I mean Shia LaBeouf did Rear Window with Disturbia so it's not like this is the first yeah like one. and also a lot of stories are going to have similar premises and we talked earlier about how there's so many things based off Shakespeare but that doesn't yeah. mean that they're bad right like exactly. the issue for me isn't that 
it was that the movie was just like it was messy and disjointed and it was kind of hard to tell exactly what was going on and it was just weird like, it was one of those things where i think some elements of like the tone and like i thought the set design inside the house was kind of cool and it was visually appealing and i thought amy adams did a really good job because she's a really good actress so even though the role was not maybe the best written like she did what she could with it and i think she brought a lot to it but it was one of those movies where i was like i don't really know how i feel about this it wasn't as bad as i think some people say it was like it had more redeeming qualities and i think people are people give it at least from the reviews i saw it wasted fair. potential yeah it was one of those kind of wasted potential or not even wasted potential but just like did they even know what the potential of this was when they were making it and then like i don't know it was just it was super disjointed and really weird and House of Gucci is not in my worst of the year list. It is number like six, but it has so many weird little problems that I don't know why some of the decisions on this movie were made that were made. Like I liked it, but there was just so many things wrong with it. But I was like, no, like it's a movie where I'm like, it's so, it's not bad. It's not a bad movie, but like, it's just, there was some elements of it. Like I think, what they did with House of Gucci is they really wanted to make the biggest tent possible. And in doing so, they sacrificed some of the elements of the movie that would have made it better because they were trying to make it appeal to as big of an audience as possible. So they were trying to keep the runtime yeah. down. I think they should have just gone full Irishman. Just make mm -hmm. it like three and a half hours and give me the full story because it feels like there was a lot that got cut from House of Gucci, especially with Maurizio's perspective that then when his character starts to change doesn't feel well established because we don't get to see a lot of him outside of what he's doing with Patrizia. So he starts to like flip on a dime, but it didn't feel like it was meant to be because like, because my thought was why does Maurizio change so suddenly in the movie? Well, it could be two things. It could be that this is meant to reflect Patrizia's perspective that she feels like he just suddenly flipped on her and she doesn't understand why. Or it could be that they didn't establish it well. And I really think it's the second one because there's tons of scenes where Patrizia's not there. This is not a movie that's only about her perspective, which would then make sense as to why we don't see Maurizio's thinking and his processing as to how he kind of flips on her. Okay. But it seems more like that got cut or that they just didn't think to include it. And it didn't feel like it was actually intentionally meant to be reflecting her perspective. Because if so, then why were there other scenes in the movie with these other side characters that aren't as important as Maurizio? where she's not there, where we get to see their perspective. Like, that doesn't make sense. And also, this is something that I hate this. I fucking hate this. And I ranted about this with, of all movies, Peter Rabbit. Peter Rabbit did this too, and it drove me fucking crazy. I hate it when movies include a bunch of pop songs, and they edit their movie like a trailer or a music video. I hate that shit. And House of Gucci did that quite a bit. There was a scene where, where the wedding scene where Patrizia and Maurizio were getting married, you can't hear the vowels because there's a fucking pop song playing. And I'm like, this is important. Turn the fucking music off. And I think what they should have done is one of two things. Either do almost like a jukebox musical style and take pop songs specifically from the era that you're portraying in the film. So like if it's 1975, all of the songs are from 1975, 1974. So and do, <laughs> Well, yeah, but like seriously, like to do, and they have like Blondie and other good stuff, but like put it in chronological order to help the, the film reflect the time period it's in because there were some modern pop songs thrown in there randomly so it felt kind of disjointed what was the songs i don't even fucking remember because i was just like what the hell's going on that or just do an original score do an original score or do pop music that is from the time period you're depicting that helps to ground the movie in the era it's supposed to be in in chronological order to so you can include the pop songs you can include some stuff people are familiar with but it still reflects an important element of the film and doesn't feel out of place because it at a certain point felt out of place and it felt excessive the other thing house of did i have to rant about this i have to the other thing house of did that pissed me off is there would be scenes and then a character would say a line and it would just cut immediately there's no time to react there's no time to see how the other characters respond there's no time to breathe it just goes quippy one-liner boom next scene and i don't know why but i hated that because it was like I want to see the characters no, you just explained, interact. you just explained what was so bad about it. Yeah, but at the same time, I have all these complaints, but I still liked the movie. Like, it wasn't a bad movie. It was just one of those movies where there was just these weird details that, like, the friends who I went to see it with, 
they're like more casual fans. They don't give a shit about analyzing it like I do. So they didn't notice these things. It didn't bother them. And I think that was kind of the intent was it was meant to be like really keeping a broad audience. And I think the pop songs and stuff too in that really quick editing was because the runtime was so long. It was two and a half hours. And I think that they thought they were going to lose that casual audience if they didn't keep the I, pace I going. And I just don't think it was necessary. I think people would have been on board they totally, they totally because it has Lady Gaga in it, and it's a crime story about high fashion. It's like, fucking Afri- it has fucking everybody. It, it hits. Well, it's got. Well, and even if we just consider the leads, Adam Driver and Lady Gaga, that's a solid. Like he's current and you know like marketable. Yeah. Lady Gaga has staying power. She's been famous for like ten years. She's not going anywhere. <laughs> it's got a really good supporting cast. It's got the high fashion element. It's got the true crime element. It's got a lot of stuff in it that's really good. But then there's just some weird decisions where I'm like, what the fuck is going on? And I thought it was especially weird compared to The Last Duel, because there were two movies this year that were historical crime movies starring Adam Driver, directed by Ridley Scott. And The Last Duel is my number one movie. I thought it was really well done and really tight. Like, it really had an identity and knew what it wanted to be. But I House mean, of Gucci wanted to be everything to everyone, and, and in the process was kind of messy. It does feel like Scott had more passion for Last Duel than he did with House of Gucci. Well, I think he had more passion for it as a piece of art. Like, I think House of Gucci, like I said, they're trying to cast the biggest tent possible to get in as many, like, casual fans who just might want to see Lady Gaga in a movie or are just interested in true crime or are just interested in high fashion. Like, pulling all these people in so they tried to make it as sort of broadly appealing as they could. So there's the comic relief character, there's the pop songs, there's the fast editing... Um, like that kind of thing, right? So I think that that was the issue. I think with The Last Duel, it felt like it had more artistic integrity, like it knew what it wanted to be. Yeah. And it stuck to that vision, even if it was slow, even if it was uncomfortable, even if it was dreary, they stuck with it. Whereas The House of Gucci kind of wanted to be too many things at once. Yeah. For me, like I think they should have been a little more subtle with it and they should have downplayed some elements yeah of see that's the issue with our worst movie the army of the dead it yeah. wanted to be too many things at once yeah the the concept is a cool concept it's great it's it's a walled off city full of zombies and inside that wall is a bank safe and you're gonna rob it but does the movie have any robbing of the bank safe no no. Does the movie have about 20 failed setups? We walk by some zombies that are like, oh, are they dead? No, they activate with water. Oh, you think they'd come back to play? No. Oh, they're also a super zombie army. And there's there's a there's a hierarchy, and they, they, they kidnap so they can make new zombie babies, and they have to cut off the head of the big zombie because there's a side mission. And the skeletons you see in the safe are really them from an alternate dimension, but we don't talk about that. Like, how... That, that was so fucking pointless but like if you put all these storylines in a movie and you don't explain them you expect fans to cling on to that people yeah. hate that like you can leave one or two easter eggs like you can leave the skeletons in the safe but you can't have seven different freaking timelines in your movie you can't you gotta have yeah. one keep it simple Zack snyder made the two worst movies this year and last year justice league cut and this other one he literally had a chance to go back and fix it and fix the storylines and flesh out the characters and the action sequences. And what did he do with it? He added more filler. Well, see, and personally, I think that's just a problem with Zack Snyder generally. I don't like his work. I don't Me think neither. he's a very good director, personally. Personally. I just don't think he's that good. Like, even people talk about, he did Sucker Punch, right? That was, yeah. 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 Like, people talk about Sucker Punch, I'm like, Sucker Punch it sucks. is like... It's also misogynistic as fuck. It's a like, fever dream. Well, and even still, like, some of the implications in that movie are, like, maybe not the hard-hitting, like, feminist critique he thought it was, where I'm like... <laughs> Wait, that was a feminist critique? So I don't fucking here's know, the thing. people like to talk about his it ex- like it is. His own personal explanation is, I take the way certain men see women, and I show it in there as, like, a... Uh, as a, I don't know, as like a poetic justice type of thing. And look, if that's what he was going for, it didn't work. that would have been fine. But the thing is, he does make it a lot more flashy than he needed. Well, and here's the thing. Like, this is a, like, if he's trying to make it a commentary or a piece of satire, commentary and satire, like, I didn't come up with this quote, but I use it all the time. They need to be very clear in their intent and their target and their purpose, lest they just become the thing that they're trying to critique. And I think that's the problem that I have with Sucker Punch that in his process of trying to, like, maybe make some kind of commentary, the spectacle of the movie 
overrides, because that's the other thing too, and this is um, from, like Lindsay Ellis talked about this in her series about Transformers, in film, the visuals will always override what you have written in the text because that's what people will remember. And the way you frame something can change it completely. Yeah. So even if you're intending this to be a commentary on like sexism or the way that some men see or treat women, if you frame the women the way that these men see them and do not interrogate it at all, you have just recreated the thing you're claiming to criticize. That is the tough thing. And this is the biggest them. problem with the DCEU. Everything yeah. has Zack Snyder's touch on it. And he well, is out anymore. of touch with the audience. Not, his... not anymore, <laughs> thankfully. No, he executive he... produces everything still. He's still connected with it. He still yeah, has the credit. Yeah, like, but at the same time, watching The Suicide Squad, watching Birds of Prey, and even Shazam, it's nice that Warner Brothers is finally giving the other directors like their own piece of the cake. Except for Wonder Woman, it really does feel like Patty Jenkins is kind of piggybacking off of his style. It's very much his style, like, because she's got to stick to what they're doing with Wonder Woman. But, like, if you're going to, and this is the biggest problem with the DCU and Army of the Dead, if you're going to have this big, giant crossover movie, this should be the seventh, eighth movie in the series. Because you have to establish all the characters. You have to establish the alternate timelines. So then, say they establish an alternate timeline where they go to the heist and they die in the safe, right? We see that. That's a movie in itself. We have another one where we meet the safe cracker fellow, which they did, which I didn't even bother watching. He, we was, have a, we well, have a, he was the most fucking obnoxious character in that film. And like, and you I have not gonna watch all these storylines, and the only way all these storylines works is if you have time to establish this. So you need to make a simple movie of just the one guy. And, and, he, gave him, and he gave himself a shitload of time. This is like two and a half like, hours. Like, you can't make a deal with Netflix to make five films to flush out this whole world to make it make sense. Yeah. And, like, at the end, this is my biggest issue with the movie. We, like, say we don't care about all the side characters and all the side plots in this. Oh, and say we just that. focus on this. But at the end, everyone dies in the helicopter. Like, yeah. what is the actual point? All like, of, let our hero all get out of line. All of yeah. one, but, like, she wasn't that good She's stupid. Character. She's like, I want to go into the zombie place because... My friend. I want to save someone from a super zombie who's trying to procreate and start a new race because the government did it, you know? Like, yeah, that's so... a movie in itself. Don't do anything else. Just do that. <laughs> There's just too much happening, and Zack Snyder is too bloated, and his fans are not helping. Zack Snyder fans, no, they need to understand. They're the... Yeah. Like, you give them the black and white Justice League Snyder cut, and they lose their minds, and now they want the David Ayer extended cut. Be happy you got the movie and shut the fuck up. <laughs> well, and I think that this is the same problem um, that happened with Star Wars. And I think that's part of why Rise of Skywalker ended up so bad is that sometimes the loudest fans are the most obnoxious, but they don't necessarily represent sometimes. the majority. Sometimes. <laughs> I'm trying to be generous here. The loudest, <laughs> but yeah, the loudest fans are usually the obnoxious people are the loudest, and they but they don't represent the entirety of everyone who's going no. to see that movie. They're just the people who they are the loudest. Re- they don't even represent online. the entirety of the fans. Exactly, right? But then because they're so loud and obnoxious about it, the studios take that as... Because that's the thing. There are Zack Snyder fans who are not complete raging. Oh, and they're probably just like, yeah, I'm really glad I got the movie, yeah, and that's they're it. They're not the, the ones that are it. sending campaigns of letter writing and harassing it's people on Twitter. still no, on they, Twitter. They're right? still trending to release the Snyderverse. How like, the fucking thing the you're not thing getting. is... <laughs> yeah. The weird thing is, they were defending the Whedon cut before they even realized it was the Whedon cut. They will defend anything. And of course, as soon as that hashtag came out, they were just as easy to snap out of it. I saw one lady on Twitter who, when she found a negative review of what we now know to be the Whedon cut, we didn't know that yet, basically used Snyder's child's death as an excuse to bully that reviewer. And I just sat there and I went, that that is wrong. Zack Snyder would spit in your face if he saw that. Yeah, like people. But he's not doing anything to shut down the fans. He's not telling them to stop. He's not. The sad thing is, he is he is jumping on the. But if he said, "Hey, I'm really glad I got this other cut. Thanks so much. I'm glad you guys liked it. But please, this is the end of it. Thank you so much for supporting me." That's what he needs to say. Like DC DC actors are like the peacekeepers when it comes to this shit. Well, I know, and like, and the same thing with fucking Star Wars, like, and I noticed, like, and I don't bring it back to that, but that's because that's, for me, the other big fandom that this came, comes up. Yeah. Because the other movies that I tend to like, like, don't have this, right? Like, Pig doesn't have a massive no. raging fan True. base. 
that's tweeting harassment to like Nicolas Cage, right? Like that's not happening. The West Side Story crowd is not getting up in my face. Yeah, like I haven't seen any. <laughs> I've like... gotten I've gotten so annoyed with like the West Side Story complaints on both sides of things because that's the weird thing I really don't understand. So I haven't seen it, so I can't comment on. Yeah, on any like, of that, and I don't know only... much of the critique of what's going on. But here's the problem: at the end of the day. It's a movie, people. It's fake. I need to chill. You need to chill. It's just a movie. It's the whole point is that it is fake. That we are escaping the things that are real. Well, honestly, I'm kind of in the middle. Because, like, I think that on one end, yeah, it's fake. And I think, like, obviously there needs to be the bounds of reason of, like, we don't need to be harassing people over the shit. We don't yeah. need to be, like, like, like really, like, being malicious to people. Like, there's a line when it crosses and, like, that that's not okay to, like, harass people and, you know, disparage them in ways that are really hurtful and unfair, like using, like, the death of Zack Snyder's child to, like, make the point. Like, that's fucked up and you shouldn't do it. But, like, I think that sometimes, too, the conversation about, like, what responsibility do filmmakers have to the kinds of people they're portraying, the subjects they're portraying, what impact does media have on people's worldview, and how does it help to shape the way that people think about the world? These are important things to talk about. And I don't think it's unfair to critique media along those lines or to draw a line in the sand, right? Like, well, I'm not going to watch licorice pizza because I'm not comfortable with a woman my age having sex with a teenager. And I don't want to watch that. But that's if other very people, fair. But if other people want to watch it, See, fine. Heard... And I'm going to hold back my critique on it, though, until I know the way it portrays that subject matter, right? Because for yeah, me, the issue I know, isn't... Yeah, like, I issue... know people who have seen it, and apparently it's nowhere near as... They, they say it's nowhere near as gross as some people make it out to Yeah, me, but, like, part of the problem is, like, I don't know if I feel comfortable going to see that in a theater and, like, and, like giving my money for it. Like, I don't know. Like, it's one of those things where I'm not sure personally yeah, that's where fine. I want to drive. Yeah, and if you're not sure, that's... if you don't want to support but, like, something, don't give money to it. Yes, but I might it. watch it if, like, it comes out and it's on DVD at the library. I would take it oh, out yeah. and take it home and watch it to see, yeah. just to kind of get an idea for maybe what it is, because part of the problem, too, is, like, is it the, the problem isn't inherently that it depicts that kind of relationship. That, to me, is not inherently an issue. My only concern is how does it depict that relationship, right? Like, what ideas about that kind of relationship does it portray like does it show this as a positive relationship does it critique it at all how does it handle it right because especially in in media and in culture there's a really big problem with like teenage boys essentially being seen as like unable to be victims of sexual assault from grown women because it's like well teenage boys always want to have sex and they always want older women and i would be lucky if my teacher had sex with me and it's like no you would have been abused like that's what it would that would be a lawsuit and a firing and many other things yeah and also too the thought of like if you reversed it and it was a 25 year old man having sex with a 15 year old girl people would have had a different answer so that would be my concern but that doesn't mean i think the movie should never have been made it just depends on how the movie depicts the subject matter the, mm-hmm. the framing is i think more important than yeah the actual and that's issue. and that's kind of my problem when these uh out these outrage moments come out i just look at this and even when i agree with them on it i just sit there and go okay so it doesn't match our experiences problem with that is everyone is everyone's experiences even in the groups of our own are completely separate and no movie can really cater to every side of that group whether and some movies hit not. you better than other because you're like i experienced that uhf experience hits me perfectly <laughs> i i don't i'm not even gonna go there it's that. just I, I get the idea just, of wanting to create <laughs> there's so much about army of the dead that you haven't gotten to yet and this was the I'm thing that, to be nice to it this is the Don't thing nice. that just fucking infuriated me everyone complains about how too serious Zack snyder movies are and then we get this, where he thinks that he's funny. Oh. Snyder, um, <laughs> stick to stick to being dark and brooding, because you suck at the comedy. Only... The side yeah. characters were fucking atrocious. No character development. Not a single character development, except for Dave Bautista. Yeah, and Dave He loves Bautista, his daughter, that's all he gets for the whole movie. And look, Dave Bautista does give... But at least give... he gets to love his daughter. That, that's that's it. It. Look, Dave Bautista does give a really good performance. No doubt about that. And it shows that he's got better acting chops than most people would make him out to be. But at the same time, like, everyone... One of the big focal points, uh, publicity-wise, was replacing Chris D'Elia with Tig Notaro because of everything. But yeah, if I'm being that. honest, I hated every second of Tig Notaro. Her jokes did not land whatsoever. And I think they chose her just because she's as deadpan as D'Elia, but... 
this really goes to show that deadpan comics are still like unique from each other like yeah. Dalia can deliver a joke in a way different from her and the material that she was given was not suited for her whatsoever so in her case i can't really say i blame her and honestly yeah. i didn't even notice how fake half the backgrounds were i'm not worried about the cg that was the least but, of my I worries mean, the german safe cracker who somehow got his own movie before this even got on netflix it came out like a few months afterwards i don't know yeah there are big the Big Bang Fury cast has more dignity and more realism <laughs> than this fucking no, idiot. No, that's actually true. Chuck Lorre could make a better Army of the Dead movie. And the thing is, what if as we much as the Lorre cut, at least the Lorre cut. As much as people give Big Bang Theory crap, at least that show points out when nerds are being losers for no good reason. When they're being whiny and insufferable. I can't stand the show personally. I and it makes total I and it makes total <laughs> sense why anyone would. I was on board for the first few years. I watched then... the first four seasons. I thought there were some good moments, like the Flash moment and then the See, robot. That was, that was, was like really a fun. little bit into it because I was in high school and my parents watched it, so I was mm. kinda like, Yeah, and I hadn't really developed to a lot of my like own taste yet. Like when you're still in high school, you're kinda developing yeah. what you like and how you're gonna navigate like sort of adult media because you're starting to transition into watching like films for adults and actually understanding them that was kind of so that was kind of that was kind of my experience See, when it comes to you know what's worse than big bang theory young Sheldon. never watch I didn't, it i didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't get never that it. i, I didn't get that vibe it's just so vanilla there's no there's no comedy or good storytelling in it it's just why does it exist? It's just a cash grab. It is yeah. more mundane, but that's also kind of what got me to watch, like, a few episodes whenever it was on TV. Plus, the actors are much less... They're less in your face than the Big Bang Theory, so I think that's kind of what got people to it's grab It's pretty much like it. Discount Wonder Years with nerds. It's very much Discount Wonder <laughs> Years. Because it starts with the animation, they tell the story when right he's down young, to, and then they go back to, this is what I learned, and now right I'm older. To, right down to Jim Parsons, like, narrating as yeah. an adult, where it turns out he is married to Amy, he somehow has kids, I'm very curious. I, I'd be, I'd be They worried. adopted. <laughs> that sounds more like the him thing to do. Yeah. I don't know, I just, I didn't but, like that show because everyone compared me to Sheldon for many years, yeah. so... Oh, Everyone no, thought I was shouting at him. And I was like, yo, is. like if you had said Leonard or like any other person on the show, I could live with it, you know? But Sheldon? If you had said the comic book guy, I could live with it. I feel like being compared to Sheldon at this point is like... It's 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 like it's not a slur, but it's getting up there. I know. I, 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 thought you were gonna, I thought you were going to say that. Sheldon is like a human minion. <laughs> no, he's Sheldon not. Sheldon is a human minion. Instead I mean, of saying butt, he says bazinga. science. Yeah, bazinga. Bazinga. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, at least the show points out he's an asshole. The minions, they're like, they cannot do no wrong. How did well, Leonard put like, up with him for nine well, seasons? Like he should have moved out. Though, too, is like with the Big Bang Theory, he's like, yeah, it points out that they're, I guess, kind of an asshole, but it's still, there's no consequence for it. It's like, Sheldon's an asshole. And it's like, okay, there and? There are consequences, and, they just don't last for That's what I mean, though. Like, there's and no poor real, Leonard, like, that relationship he has with Penny is awful for, like, the first while. It's just like, it didn't work out. You gotta move on, dude. <laughs> well, he tried moving on, and then his girlfriend moved on to somebody else. Well, yes. but, like, he shouldn't ever got together with Penny unless he stayed together with her. Like, you it can't just do it again just because you need a storyline. Well, like, like, I think the thing that's funny is I'm, I'm gonna like sidetrack the conversation a bit, but the whole <laughs> conversation. <laughs> but like, I'm trying like... to se I'm trying to segue into like the things that disappointed me in Dear Evan Hansen because. <laughs> <laughs> no, just go ahead. I think the thing with Dear Evan Hansen that to me is so funny is the fact that like Ben Platt would not let go of this role, so you just have this like 30 year old man singing with He's these not like, 30. He's... He looks 30. He looks 30 in this movie. Okay, here's my. I've said this in my video, and I'm going to say it again. Yes, Ben Platt is too old for the role. <sighs> Fucking everybody in the movie is, and you're just figuring this out well, now. I think everybody is, but I think Ben Platt, for some reason, he just, it stands out compared to some of the other cast he members. He does have a more awkward face. That he looks a little bit more awkward, and like, I don't know, there, there's issues with Jeremy Hansen. Mm. Like, Seriously, Julianne Moore is even too old to be a single mom, or at least... I don't know, for whatever reason, she dresses in a way that makes her seem older than she is, which that felt weird. I don't know anything about Dear Evan Hansen. Okay, I know look, the basic setup. I will tell you that the most interesting thing I think about Dear Evan Hansen is the fact that on the online, like, musical theater, like, fan community of people who 
could not afford to go see shows, and so they had to watch like ripped versions and listen to soundtracks. For some reason, people got the idea. I guess because there was a handful of lines in the show, because like you know the concept of Dear Evan Hansen. Yes, right? I'm aware of the concept. Yeah, um, and so there was some line about like in the show where some boys like Are you guys like gay, and so people thought that it was about a gay teenager, but it's not about a gay like Evan Hansen. See, not that gay. confused me so much. But people thought that it was, but that's a lot because musical theater is a really inaccessible art form. If you don't have money and live in New York, it's really hard to see Broadway musicals unless they film them and release them. I did yeah. see Book of Mormon at yeah. Center in the Square. That was such yeah. a fucking good. You time. have to wait for them to go on tour, essentially, and you have to have yeah. the money and the time to go to. And they're live expensive, theater. like one hundred fifty bucks a ticket. Exactly. Sometimes. So even when it's on tour, it's expensive. They are so wor- they're really... worth it, thankfully. Oh, it's but... worth it. It's just an inaccessible medium kind of by its very nature so it's easy i can see how people could get misconceptions about a show because it's hard to see it in full and you can only watch some of these shaky pirated video maybe if you find it it bugs me so much that people still put up with that like who's gonna watch a terrible cell phone video like you'll just wait till it's on netflix or whatever but you can't do that with a stage play that you don't know if it's getting a movie right so like when david hansen came out and it's a stage production, they don't know that it's getting oh, movie, right? True. So the only way to watch it is if you can find it on tour and you have the money, which a lot of mm. people just don't. Yeah. So, like, misconceptions get spread. And plus, tickets are, like, what? Maybe an audio. Exactly, right? Like, it's maybe really you just hard. listen to the audio on the shaky cell phone video and not watch the video. <laughs> But even still, that's kind of about what most people got. But so I do think it's funny that people thought Tear of Hansen was about a gay teenager, when really it's just about, like, a morally corrupt teenager. Yeah, yeah and <laughs> the weird thing <laughs> is... That wasn't the problem I had with it. Yeah. Like, him learning not how not to be an asshole and to try to get his way out of this situation, that part I could understand. And his his goal of not wanting to disappoint this family, as gross as it was, it's not like you don't understand where he was coming well, and from. And it makes sense when you're talking about a, like what, teenagers that make stupid decisions kind of notoriously because their brains aren't developed What did yet? bug me was Danny Pino from Law & Order SVU... Yeah. I loved Danny who Pino. Was, but... Who was good in the movie? Don't get me wrong. Yeah. And Amy Adams. Amy Adams in particular gives so many fucking stupid excuses and fills in so many sentences for Evan that he really doesn't have to work that hard to put up with the charade. Yeah. You know that sitcom thing where they're about to come up with a lie and something fills in the gap? That happens <laughs> a lot in Dear Evan Hansen. Like a it lot. It does, and it's fucking ridiculous. See, and, and I'm talking too also about the stage play because I haven't actually seen the movie, but I know the. So oh, was it okay. ever good? Um, no. That's one of the things a lot of people. Well, okay, well it, well, it was sort of good, but like musical theater is weird because I feel like, and this I think was um, I don't know if you've ever watched any of Jenny Nicholson's videos on YouTube. She yeah. had a really good breakdown of like just everything that went wrong with. I watched Hansen. her Millennium Falcon show on Screen Junkies Plus. Yeah, yeah and her um, her video on Dear Evan Hansen I thought was really good. Because, like, one of the things she did bring up that I think is true is that, like, a lot of musical theater, the humor of musical theater doesn't move as quickly as, like, film or TV mm. does. So it can get dated kind of quickly. And I think that kind of happened with Dear Evan Hansen. Because there's, one like, dude, some gay jokes. And the, dude like, from, sort of... the dude from Atypical, like, pissed me off every single time yeah. he opened his mouth. And, like, I didn't like him on Atypical to begin with, so I knew I was going to have a hard time yeah. with him in this. And, and like, but... there's some weird... <clears throat> kind of implications about it but like the whole show was never amazing and the music's like fine yeah the music's so it's just always mediocre uh, yeah I, that's what i think and like and that's i think that was like i think but the point of enough people video, lo- but i agree but with enough people loved it that it got yes. some tonys i'm ben platt didn't get one but i mean i like ben platt he's a talented enough guy and he's not technically bad in the movie since I mean, played it like the role was written like eight times, him. eight times a week for years. He could play this role in his sleep, and he's still pretty decent. Most of the actors are. It's just the execution of these themes, the execution of just basic minor plot details were so ridiculous. Julianne Moore's character pissed me off so much because there's one point towards the end where she's comforting Evan over how much regret he has, and she says, "I know you, and I love you." And I just sat there and I'm like, "No, you fucking." don't you are the most absent parent in a movie i have seen in years yeah you are the single mom nurse who has to work overtime because budget cuts does that make the home alone parents look responsible i'm not kidding when i say this i would rather leave evan hansen with mr and mrs turner oh from... like fairly odd parents yeah yeah 
<laughs> at least those two actually spent time with their son and actually yeah. loved him enough. Well, like, they were still selfish pricks, and that was their joke, but at the same time, like, at least they could learn their lesson fairly quickly than this lady could. Yeah. In fact, in my worst of video on my channel, I'm probably going to do a skit where, Dear where instead of instead of them barging in on uh, Timmy, it's just like, oh, Evan, I respect your privacy by knocking, but asserting my authority is your father by coming in anyway. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't get the joke. You've never, the you've never seen the show? No, I've never oh, watched it. Yeah, I know it exists. It's a Nickelodeon thing. That yes. was one of their that was one of their last great shows. Well, let's well, we're gonna wrap the show in just about a minute here, but Christmas shopping is coming up. Yep. Recommend a couple Blu-rays. People are like, if they have to go last minute, what would you buy for gifts this year? <coughs> I will throw out the wow. Criterion 4K Uncut Gems. Um, okay, yes. Yeah. That I'll one, that. great movie if you haven't seen Uncut Gems. Um it's on Netflix, you can watch it, but the, the fact that that's on a physical release, and it's a 4K, and that Adam Sandler is in any criterion at all is a miracle. Uh, but um, it's one of those, I'm like, yeah, you've got to get that. And yeah. then the other one, I would buy Jungle Cruise, because you know me, I like Jungle Cruise. Yeah, I would say um, The Green Knight for sure, because that's definitely one that if you can get it in like 4K and you have like mm. a good setup, would be really nice. Because it's just also one of those movies that I feel like would go well um, for people who, if, if you're a collector or if you're somebody who's like really into okay, yeah. film and like you have like a movie collection, that would be a good addition. I also would say, um, yeah, I'm gonna say it again, The Last Duel, because that movie did not sell in nearly enough tickets. It bombed way harder than it deserved to. I think it deserves the support. Um, so I think if you like historical movies or you like like really serious character dramas, like people who are into that kind of thing will enjoy it. This isn't like, I'm not recommending like, Everybody on your list will love a two and a half hour long yeah. movie about rape culture. But like, if you know somebody who likes like a contemplative movie or serious historical pieces or kind of something like that, I think it's worth picking up. I'm gonna get it because I want to support the movie because I think it was really well done. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of more the more casual type of movies because yeah. that's really the crowd of casual folks I go to movies with. Uh, mm -hmm. The first one, and he's he knows this one because I rented it to him. Uh, Nobody starring mm. Bob Odenkirk as a short, unpretentious action movie that is very much in the vein of John Wick just because it's written by the same dude who wrote the John Wick movies. So it very much has a lot of uh, subtle world building. It has a lot about a man who is so repressed to the point where one day he snaps and makes a stupid decision that attracts a lot of criminals knocking on his front door. The bus fight is excellent. The bus fight is good. I actually, my favorite fight of the movie is the final climax mm. where it is him, his brother Riza, I'm not kidding when I say that, and Christopher Lloyd arm themselves up with guns in a factory and man, do they have a ball. After he pays for it with a, a gold brick. Yeah, okay. him buying his... He walks in, he's like, I want to buy the place. Like, what? Yeah, gold him, brick, buy, him you buying his father-in-law's company and like... Because he has a gold bar, the father's just like, you know what, if I ask these questions, somebody's going to come knocking on my door looking for me, looking for them. I'm not going to say anything. Yeah, nobody's a solid Blu-ray pickup. Yeah. yeah. But, like, as a simple popcorn flick, it knew exactly what it was. Bob Odenkirk is actually a pretty good action star. He mm -hmm. trained for two years on the set of Better Call Saul in between yeah. lunch breaks just to nail this stuff. It might have been what caused that heart attack on set. Oh, maybe. <laughs> when you really you think about that. it, because, like, he's... You wouldn't know it, but he's in the Tom Cruise age, and he just looks it more than Tom Cruise does. Yeah. And yeah. the other one... This, to me, is one of the most underrated movies because it went strict. It went straight to Disney+, Plus because theaters weren't opened at that point yet. The only theaters they played in were in countries where they didn't have the app. This, to me, is the most underrated movie of the year, Pixar's Luca. Oh. I sure. had a great time with this I forgot this about one. that movie. That's, like, the only good animated movie this year. Well, people, was better people better like that. Oh, I have People like that one, that one. That and one. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that that'll probably win Best Animated Feature, just based on how much press it is. Yeah, it's Disney. I've made a video yeah. about this before, but Disney, the Best Animated Feature Oscar is the most popularity-driven imaginable because that's the one where people don't care the least because animation 
it gets looked down on so much. But still, she has like four children, and the idea that if something is for kids, it's not good. Which is ridiculous. Because there are tons yeah. of adult animated well, stuff. Yeah. Well, that brings me to what I was going to say, too, is it's technically from 2020, but it was released in like the fall of 2020, so I'm going to count it because I saw it this year. Okay. It's Soul. Because that oh, movie was really good. That's a great movie. Soul a was movie, good. And to me, I think Soul is a really good example of an animated movie that's not really for children. Like, that movie is really, I think, more aimed towards adults because the, the storyline and the themes... The midlife crisis themes. Yeah, 100%. relate to adults, but it's still a movie that kids can watch and enjoy. Yeah, and, and I will... think that it was a better way to take that sort of idea of, like... Because a lot of family f- movies, too, are things that are like, they're made for kids, but everyone can enjoy it. But this is the opposite. It's made for adults, but everyone can enjoy it. Exactly. And so I think that it's one of those movies that, like, that's a movie that I think if you got that on Blu-ray for, like, a casual fan, they would probably really enjoy it because it's an animated movie that takes some of the, like, visual whimsy of animation and some of the fun of a Disney Pixar movie, but puts, like, a really relatable kind of heartwarming adult story at the center of it while also making it appropriate for all ages. Like, that's, I think, a a pretty good... Mm. And kids can relate to it through Tina Fey's character discovering just how wonderful life can be. Mm. Yeah, exactly. And I feel like with... The great thing that I love about Luca is that it's probably Pixar's most simplistic story imaginable because it's their closest to telling a Studio Ghibli slice of life tale. Mm -hmm. In fact, um, the dude who directed it, who has worked with Disney for a long time, has said that Studio Ghibli has had a tremendous amount of influence towards the movie. I mean, the city that Luca and Alberto go to is literally called Porto Rosso as opposed to Porco Rosso. Yeah. And there's all this stuff, like, as opposed to building or wanting a an airplane, they go for a bicycle. It has all that same bright and vibrant, colorful stuff. To me, this is the most colorful movie Pixar has made in an extremely long time. And um, honestly, it's the chemistry between Luca and Alberto that really sold it for me. Jacob Tremblay was good as Luca, but Jack Dylan Grazer as Alberto, I loved how... He takes that usual um, mentor character who claims to know everything but has some darker stuff. I like that he only knows a tad bit more about humanity than Luca does, so he's technically still learning alongside him while also being a guide, learning about himself. And the tragic, the more tragic stuff that you always find out towards the climax is considerably darker than what you would get with any other Pixar movie. Yeah. The parent's not dead. The parent's just gone. Like, how often can you say that? That's much worse than dead. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And there's even, there's even a 12-minute short that takes place after the movie with his new father figure. I still haven't seen it, because, honestly, I'm a little worried it'll be too predictable, because it's only, like, 12 minutes, they don't have to try that hard. But it just goes to show how much thought they went into the characterization for such a straightforward story. It's two sea monsters and a young girl trying to win a triathlon from this one douchey kid who is an even more boring Pixar villain than the squiggly line thing from Soul, which I did not like Terry or whatever. I did. I actually liked uh, I get what I get why I like the main it, but... character story and thought of it. The villain really never came into play. That was well, just an annoyed employee. And I exactly. think that that's why I liked the villain though, is the villain doesn't need to be a grand scheming evildoer it can just be like an annoyed bureaucrat trying to do their job but i like those but i'm sick of those villains too and i I mean luca is just the generic bully who looks like the chef from ratatouille kind of (laughs) he kind of does though i do think Um, it works though for luca because like the stakes don't need to be that high you like for a children's movie no a shitty bully is a fine antagonist that serves here's the the thing though if he was if he was an intimidating bully or a funny bully, then I could probably sidestep better, that. Yeah. The only funny thing about him is that his twin sidekicks talk kind of in unison in a Huey, Dewey, and Louie type of way. Yeah. But the thing about Huey, Dewey, and Louie is that they were smart and they had schemes up their sleeves. Not as many schemes up their sleeves as people would associate, because I've seen a lot of old Donald Duck shorts. Donald's actually the villain in their stories of about as much as they are the villain to him. A lot of people don't realize that. I've watched a lot of those shorts. Well, that's pretty much it for the show today. Um, Nikki, do you have anything you want to plug? Anything you want to tell people? Not officially, not yet. I'm writing 
<laughs> I don't know if I'll ever make it, but I'm hoping that one day I'll eventually finish writing and filming the video essay I have about why I think the last tool pumps so hard. I ride really hard for that movie. <laughs> I ride really hard for Adam Driver just generally. So like, I get I... last duel, gotta love it, love all that weird shit. You're talking to somebody who like spent a week editing a video essay about the fucking DuckTales reboot. <laughs> But I stand behind that because that may be the last great Disney anything to come out lately. That's fair. And Tyler, where can we find you? You can find me just by typing in my name, Tyler Wolf, with two Fs. And what are those two Fs Oh, for? they're fucking fantastic. Yes, they are. <laughs> it works. It's great. I have reviews up as we're making this podcast for Belfast, Come On, Come On, and West Side Story. And pretty soon I'll be having reviews up for Spider-Man No Way Home, Matrix Resurrections, and a few other things just to wrap up the year of 2021. I'm not going to be putting up my best of the year list until 2022 once I've seen The Tragedy of Macbeth. Because yeah, I have a feeling that that might be up on my list. Yeah, my list will probably change once I see that too. Oh, more, more than likely. Yeah. Well, if they release a Lego movie, we'll top my list and maybe my best of all time. Thanks for joining us on the on the Josh and Tyler show. Thank you, Mickey, for joining us on today's show. And Tyler, say something awesome. The Josh and Tyler show is back. <laughs> <laughs>